I, I know that you're here because you too want to better understand how equity work affects the crisis response in Ohio for both mental health and addiction issues. And we know that mental illness and addiction do not discriminate. They can affect any person anywhere at any time, regardless of age, race, ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, or geographic location. In fact, we find that certain groups experience negative behavioral health outcomes at rates disproportionate to the overall population in the state of Ohio. For example, white rate of suicide increased among white communities by around two percentage points between 2010 and 2021. And we're continuing to see that rate increase. Rates of suicide death among Ohio's African-American population increased more than four percentage points over the same time period. So a higher rate of increase among uh, Black Ohioans, particularly Black males. There are also estimates of adults who are living with mental health impairment that are lower than they were 10 years ago. Yet estimates for Hispanic Ohioans with mental health impairment have nearly doubled since 2012. We see similar disparities in our overdose death and overdose data among minority Ohioans. And that includes LGBTQ plus Ohioans as well. We also know that geography makes a difference and that geography in and of itself uh, can create cultural uh, experiences for people. In Appalachia, where I'm from uh, originally, we know that stigma of talking about and getting help for mental health and addiction issues is real and it's preventing people from getting care. We also know there's less access, less capacity in Appalachian and rural parts of our state. And we know that farmers are dying at higher rates of suicide death than other occupations or other men in our communities. We also know that um, men are overdosing at higher rates, higher numbers. They have higher suicide rates, higher suicide numbers. And there are more men in our state psychiatric hospitals and our state prisons than, um, than women and that they're experiencing high rates of mental health and substance use disorders as well. Culture matters, it's linguistic and cultural competency. And this is an important topic, not just here in Ohio, but everywhere. But we're embracing the opportunity to make sure that our workforce is prepared to make sure everyone feels welcome in the services that we're offering and that they have a true belief and confidence in the competency which, which will be delivering these services. We know that 97% of the behavioral health workforce are higher, uh, have higher education degrees and are white women. And so when you think about who's experiencing higher rates and prevalence of mental illness and substance use disorders, overdose and suicide death in our workforce, we have this opportunity to improve our cultural and linguistic competency. Governor Mike DeWine has made sure that cultural competency and health equity is a priority for his administration. And our department continues to focus efforts aimed at advancing health equity to ensure that all Ohioans have a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And in the governor's words, to live up to their full God-given potential. In conjunction with ensuring quality services, this involves addressing social determinants of health, such as employment and housing stability. And so as you hear us at the department talk about not just all of our work, but our crisis continuum specifically, we have connect, respond, stabilize, and then thrive, this opportunity for people to have better housing opportunities, more employment opportunities, more connection and purpose um, in their local community to people who are supporting them and their goals. The department made significant investments of state and federal resources to address health disparities and promote health care quality among diverse populations. And information about health policy, cultural and linguistic competency, health literacy, and more is available through our website. Our Disparities and Cultural Competency Advisory Committee, our DAC committee, is comprised of staff and external community partners who continue to guide our efforts to amplify the voices of Ohio's diverse people and communities and assure a report further cementing service equity as a priority in the public behavioral health system. So I invite you to visit our Disparities and Cultural Competence Advisory Committee webpage, our DAC webpage, 
for more resources. You'll find articles and information, promising practices that are getting good outcomes for the many diverse people in Ohio. With that, I wanna turn it back over to Fonda. I wish all of you uh, a great learning experience here today. I'm grateful that you're prioritizing this time to learn more about crisis work, but also about how to improve health equity for everyone that reaches out through our crisis system. Thank you. Thank you, Director Chris. I wanna also thank the department as well as the, the administration of their continuous focus on health equity, as well as their support for the Crisis Academies. At this point, I want to introduce to you April McKee. She's going to be sharing her story with us, as well as her experiences with Ohio's crisis system. Hi, my name is April. Um, I am the mother of a 31-year-old son with dual diagnosis issues. I am also a clinician who has worked in the field for over 25 years. As a family member, I was fortunate because I had some understanding of how the system worked of dual diagnosis issues and crisis intervention techniques. My son was fortunate because my training allowed me to remain calm most of the time while my knowledge helped him to obtain needed resources. He had family support a lot of consumers don't have. His family has been able to financially support him. He can focus on his treatment. Some consumers and their families don't have these privileges. And living in Appalachia puts someone at higher risk to live in poverty. As I share our story, I hope to highlight how equity in a crisis is not simply about financial resources. The support consumers and their families obtain when they reach out for help can influence whether they will reach out again. My son spent two years in a state of psychosis. He was completely incompetent. He lived in a world of fantasy. At times he thought he was God. Once he thought I was God. He talked out loud to the voices. Once he talked to the voices about cutting his head off. He made up a game where the loser of the game died for real. I spent two years in a constant state of fear and crisis. I was afraid he would hurt himself, a family member or someone in the community. I was afraid someone might victimize him. I tried my best to manage him and to advocate for him. I could not understand, despite my knowledge of how the system worked, how I could be left with very few resources to deal with the situation, specifically because of my warnings of the possible danger he posed to others. I warned a number of treatment professionals of the danger to others I believed he posed. My son is quiet and passive, but I was afraid of him in active psychosis, especially when he was using meth. He believed the voices in his head. Why would no one help him if I walked away after my warnings? In my experience, we are relying on the criminal justice system to address dual diagnosis issues, and this system failed my son. My son was charged with a misdemeanor because he took his significant other's car without her permission. She'd been calling law enforcement for help prior to this incident. I spoke with the public defender prior to his sentencing. I explained his severe issues of psychosis substance use. He was put on municipal court probation for helping with his divorce. He did receive treatment because I endorsed it. He was sick and yet I drove him to appointment. Sometime after I filed a mental health commitment, he was charged with possession of drugs in the felony court for an incident that happened approximately 10 months prior. I called the prosecutor's office before filing the mental health affidavit. I found no help because he had no charges. After he was placed into a diversion program, my son had a relapse of both mental health and AOD symptoms in the summer months of 2022. He was ordered to go into residential treatment after his second psychiatric hospitalization in two months. He went to a residential treatment center, still psychotic after leaving the psychiatric hospital. I advised his diversion officer, the residential center didn't have adequate mental health for my son's needs prior to finding out he was going there. I told the residential center he was psychotic the day I dropped him off. He talked to voices for an hour and a half while I drove him there. He somehow ended up at the emergency room in that county. The reason he ended up there is conflicting. He signed himself out of the hospital despite being actively psychotic. He ended up in an unfamiliar county with no resources. I went to find him because no one else would help him or I. I wasn't allowed to file a missing person report because he was an adult. 
I found help when I contacted the mental health board in that county. Two days later, after he was discharged from the hospital, I received a call from the Ohio State Patrol. They found him walking to church on Saturday. He was somewhere between Gallipolis and home, I believe. My son asked them to call his mom. I went to pick him up. I brought him to the emergency room. He went into the psychiatric hospital in Columbus the same day. Three to five days later, he came back to my house in a cab. I had no idea that he was coming, no warning, no idea of his mental state, and he had no way into my house until I got off work. Thankfully, his outpatient providers went to check on him after I notified them of what occurred after my, no my neighbor notified me my son was back. The criminal justice system that sent him to the residential program did nothing to help me once he ended up on the street. My son is labeled a criminal, but this system did not help him. And this system is the system we utilize most frequently to order people to get help. I believe we are expecting more out of our consumers and their families than they can do. I had a person in the field tell me my son needed to take responsibility. I understood the concept and I agreed. However, I knew he wasn't capable of what she was asking at the time. I also knew he was identified as developmentally disabled in elementary school. My son has learning disabilities. He had one-on-one -on -one help and an IEP for every subject in school. He can read and write with limited ability. He laid around my house holding his daughter's cocomelon doll for about a month after he came back from being on the street for two days in the other county. Does this sound like someone able to take responsibility or a hardened criminal? A staff member from a psychiatric hospital in Columbus told me my son came in both suicidal and homicidal. She told me the staff at the hospital couldn't talk to him for three days after he was hospitalized. She told me he'd take off running in fear. She told me he listened to the voices and did what they told him to. He was discharged from that psychiatric hospital within a couple of days after my conversation with that staff member. How could this be? I filed a mental health affidavit with my local probate court with the help of my local 317 board. I was unable to file it without their help. I'd like to say filing paperwork in court resolved everything, but it did not. It took more time, additional hospitalizations, and the appropriate mental health treatment for my son to finally show signs of improvement. My son has been diagnosed with schizophrenia, among other things. He also has substance abuse issues, including an amphetamine diagnosis. Most of the agencies treating him focused on the substance abuse issues. His mental health issues were not being treated correctly. His psychosis was not present just when he used meth. I couldn't get anyone to really hear me until we switched over to his current provider. I watch him take his medications for his psychosis, anxiety, and his AOD issues every day because he's shown he can't responsibly take or handle the medication. He is fortunate because he is able to utilize the medication he needs because he has someone to administer them every day. As long as he doesn't use meth, this coupled with outpatient treatment for dual diagnosis is effective treatment for him. His case manager sees him twice a week and transports him to his mental health appointments because I am at work. I attend his monthly psychiatric appointment with him. I take him to see his AOD treatment provider where he also gets Suboxone. My son was hospitalized approximately 18 to 24 times from January of 2020 until October of 2022. He was hospitalized twice in 2022 within approximately two months because he relapsed after five months and used meth. He was sent to the same psychiatric hospital in Columbus both times. They changed his medications both times. They took him off the medication he'd been successfully taking for psychosis for five months. I have served in the role of case manager, driver, children's services, and his nurse giving him meds. I have financially supported him, including his children's needs when they're at my house three weekends a month since January, 2020. There is a lack of resources to assist consumers and their families. I oftentimes did more work than the people being paid to help. My son is fortunate because I can financially support him with a little struggle. Some consumers and their families have little or no financial resources. I do not believe agencies have adequate resources to address the amount of need there is. So as a professional, I had understanding of the resources my son was using and understanding that the people treating my son had many more people to help. Unfortunately, that understanding didn't relieve my stress or provide me the help I very desperately needed. One of the most frustrating things for me was feeling unheard. I could get help quickly in my professional role. As a mother, I waited one time for over an hour for our local sheriff. 
HIPAA at times prevented me from getting vital information and from coordinating his care, even though I was his primary caretaker. I was still on the clock when his providers clocked out. Once my son refused to sign a release for me, perhaps because he was psychotic, perhaps because he was mad at me because I told his treatment team what was going on, HIPAA can be a barrier to care. The process for obtaining crisis care in Appalachia can be difficult. To get care, I had to call the crisis unit during typical work hours and the sheriff after hours. I was told they would evaluate and decide if he needed hospitalized. For a family member also in crisis trying to get help, this information is difficult to hear. If they decide to not take my son because I don't say the right thing or he says the right thing, I'm left with him in his current state and he is angry with me. My son always went to the emergency room to wait to be evaluated. Sometimes it would be hours before he was evaluated. I came to mistrust the people assessing his need for hospitalization. I felt very strongly he needed hospitalized, but it wasn't always happening. I started to become argumentative with professionals. I started to take him to our local emergency room myself. I once put myself in a dangerous situation trying to get him to our local hospital. My son started pushing my foot down on the gas pedal as we were driving there. I had to pull over and call the sheriff. As a mother, I didn't understand why he was always hospitalized for such a short time and sometimes not at all. As a treatment provider, I believe the reason was our laws, his rights, and a lack of resources. Typically, the only thing the psychiatric hospitals did in Columbus was hold him several days and change his medications. He wasn't kept long enough to get a proper diagnosis or see if the medication was effective. He'd come back home still psychotic. Once a psychiatric hospital kept him longer, he left right from there to go to a dual diagnosis residential program in Ironton. They drove him to Athens when I refused to pick him up. Unknown caller. I don't know where they dropped him off. A staff member there told me his mental health was too severe for them to treat him. I asked that staff member, if you can't manage him, how am I supposed to manage him? I did eventually continue to try because no one else would help him. I was afraid for his safety and the safety of others. I believe there was no hope if he had no one and nothing. There was very little continuity of care between the psychiatric hospitals and its outpatient providers. There was very little, if any, communication with his mental health providers in Athens. More than once, he came home in a cab while I was at work. Why was I not notified he was being discharged as his caretaker for the same reason he wasn't getting hospitalized? The law say an adult is able to make their own choices whether they are competent or not as long as they don't threaten to harm self or others. I decided if something happened to my son, I would put in his obituary when he died that he died from adulthood. My son knew what to say and what not to say, and sometimes he could manipulate the crisis screener. Once he told a crisis screener he would take the medicine so that screener didn't recommend psychiatric hospitalization. The next day I received a call from my neighbor. He was running down Route 13. This time he was hospitalized. I called the crisis line myself. I explained the situation. I said, you're going to do what you're going to do, but I'm telling you he needs hospitalized. This is the hospitalization where I was contacted informed he was both suicidal and homicidal. He was under a mental health community commitment through our probate court at this time. There was a lack of resources statewide for mental health. The lack of resources looks very different in Appalachia as we have no options for psychiatric care. And most of the people living here, including myself, are unable to pay for care. Outpatient treatment is available if someone has the means to pay. However, there is considerable poverty here. Insurance of any kind determines what care you're allowed. Most insurance companies look at cost to the company over need of the person. I understand this, but what happens to the people at high risk like my son? It can be some to it can be difficult for some to get to appointments due to transportation issues. We don't have the infrastructure to treat the need in Appalachia. My son is fortunate because he has someone to fill in the gaps in his care. He has someone to advocate for his needs. In my experience from what I witnessed trying to help him, there are a lot of people falling through the cracks. In some cases, they're living on the street because their family also abandons them. I cannot judge that decision because I've walked in those shoes. There were times I gave up because the stress on me was too much. I was suffering going through this trauma. I always went back to try again to try something else, despite the stress and fear of the consequences to myself. Sometimes people like my son are relying on others like them, supporting each other as best they can with few resources. Sometimes they're incarcerated in our revolving criminal justice door, not getting the help they need to address the underlying issues. I am grateful. <clears throat> I 
I am grateful this was not the path my son had to go down. I am happy to say my husband, I am happy to say my son has been hospitalized in seven months. I believe his current stability is a result of my continuing to push for his care. My son stayed in what I considered a drug house for several months. His treatment providers went there to ensure he received services. The people living there eventually made him leave and he came home. They didn't like his treatment professionals showing up at their house. Five months later, when he relapsed in 2022, I discovered one of them was meeting my son and bringing him meth. I messaged the person from my son's phone. I told them my son was once again in the psychiatric hospital because he chose to bring him meth knowing what it did to him. I told him I, if I found him anywhere near my house, I was calling the sheriff. At this point, I also took control of my son's Suboxone, not knowing if it was legal for me to do so. I notified his treatment team of my decision. We had some really good people working in the field that continued to support him and I. A private counselor who provided me support and validated my, my decisions while providing me charity on some of my co-pays even during the pandemic. My NAMI groups, which provided me with the space and grace to vent and the support I needed to keep fighting. I hope the safety plan we have in place and his community commitment in probate court will help him obtain the resources he needs much quicker next time. I hope there won't be a next time. I watch my son now trying to put the pieces back together. He wants to drive. He wants to work. He wants a new relationship because his children's mother did decide it was too much. He is a father to his children with some support. I feel joy just watching him do a puzzle with his daughter or wrestle with his son. For a couple of years, I had to protect my grandchildren from their father. There were times they couldn't see him because his symptoms were too severe or he was in the hospital. At those times, I explained what was going on in medical terms. I haven't had to have those conversations in seven months. Again, my son is fortunate he didn't lose his children, which are an important piece of his recovery. More importantly, my grandchildren haven't lost their dad. They were told dad's issues weren't his fault, but he was responsible for getting the help he needed. They were told he could be part of our lives as long as he was getting the help he needed. If he wasn't getting the help he needed, they were told we needed to take care of ourselves and hope he would get it. They were always told he loved us, even when I knew he wasn't showing it. I hope with continued treatment and family support, my son continues to be able to live his best life. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, April. Thank you for sharing your story, sharing your son's story, your advocacy, especially, you know, oftentimes we don't necessarily recognize that the Appalachian culture and the perspectives it comes from. So, you know, in our Health Equity um, Crisis Academy, we truly appreciate your time and sharing your story as we continue to build out our crisis system. At this point, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Robin Roberts. Robin is the director of the Mono County Behavioral Health in Mammoth, California. Mono County is one of California's remaining remote and rural areas. Robin will be sharing equity considerations for crisis response in rural communities. Robin will also be sharing equity considerations for rural communities. Robin is going to figure out how to share her slide show first and her screen. And uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for um, inviting me to be here today. I am from California. I'll explain that I'm not from that California and that um, there are ways in which um, the story that April just told us is very similar to what we have here in California and certainly what we have here in Mono County. So let me start with sharing my screen and hopefully doing this in a way that is helpful. Um, I do have one disclaimer that I need to let you know, and that is, um, sorry, trying to figure this out here. Um, and that is that I have dogs here at the house. And um, given that my dogs might bark if somebody comes up on our road or there's a squirrel that goes by, um, they may interrupt a little bit of what I'm talking about. Okay, 
Can you see my screen? It doesn't seem like you can. We can see it, Robin. Um, you're not in presentation mode. But no, we... I, that, that part I figured out. Now am I? Nope, not, there you are. Okay. Wow. Technical. So hi, my name is Robin Roberts. I'm um, I'm here to, this morning from Mono County, California. We are in the eastern part of California. Uh, if you follow the news and our weather has been a part of your newscasts, um, Mono County received more snow this year in the winter than in recorded history. Uh, at least by the white folks. And that means that we received over 800 inches. I don't know what that translates to feet, but it was a relentless winter. And it really um, amplified the ways in which we are remote. We're not just a rural county, we're a very, very remote county. And um, the suffering that occurred for people, especially with mental health or SUD issues, the isolation that people were feeling, uh, was very much akin to when we had a shutdown here during the COVID pandemic. So Mono County is a little different than, Ohio, or sorry, California is a little bit different than Ohio in lots of ways. You have 88 counties, we have 58. California has an enormous and very huge um, population throughout the, the state itself. The policy here is driven by the L, what we call the LA standard. So Los Angeles County with over 10 million people has um, about 7,000 employees in their mental health system. So their, their county mental health system in Los Angeles has about 7,000 employees. Mono County has 28 and our land mass is rather large. Um, however, when policy is made at the state level, um, what happens, which I assume probably also happens in Ohio, is that the regulations and the money goes to the larger counties that have a larger population, and then Mono County is expected to meet the regulatory standards of an L.A. county, but without the same amount of money. So you can see where Mono County is. Um, we are we are we border a very mountainous part of Western Nevada. We are in eastern part of California. We have one highway. It's called 395. And when it during the winter time, that highway closed many, many times. We have no. We have one hospital in the um, Mammoth Lakes area. It's a medical hospital. Primarily deals with ski and mountain bike injuries because we are a tourist economy, and we. Um, drive approximately five hours to get to a hospital if somebody's under a 72 hour hold. In California, we call that the 5150, it's 72 hour hold against a person's will for psychiatric reasons. It's called um, if you're suicidal, homicidal or gravely disabled. At any given time in the state of California, there's about 3,000 people looking for a bed for acute care, and there are approximately 380 beds at any given time in the state of California. So we are really well versed here in Mono County in keeping people in the county as much as possible unless we absolutely have to hospitalize someone for the very sake that either we can't get there due to weather or it's very far away and it can be very traumatizing for the person that we are hospitalizing. We do hospitalize folks when needed, um, but mostly what we do and what we're quite good at is what we call a wraparound. It's not the official wraparound that you might have in your state that we have here in California, but it's a way of wrapping services and natural supports around people um, who are having a psychiatric crisis. So this is some pictures of Mono County. It's an incredibly beautiful place. It's an incredibly remote place. Um, there are mountains that um, separate us from really, truly most of the rest of the world, really tall mountains, like almost 15,000 feet. Um, <clears throat> it is a place where we have uh, four tribal nations. They are extremely isolated, probably very similar to your Appalachian areas. They are isolated. They are um, have his, plenty of historic trauma and a lot of poverty. 
And so we work really hard um, to create relationships with our tribal nations and anybody that lives <clears throat> in one of our remote areas. Um, and I can explain a little bit about how we go about that as a government agency, because um, I'm sure you probably have heard this if you're in the field. They don't really like government. They don't trust government. They don't think government is helpful. I don't disagree with that. Um, however, as the director of a mental health organization, I do what, everything we can in order to find ways to create relationship that helps people feel that they can access us when they're having a crisis or for any reason, actually. We, we try to get there before the crisis if we can, certainly. But um, I think very similar to what April talked about, I have I don't have similar the same stories in my own family with my own sons, but um, I have seen that story take place for other families, very similarly to what she talked about over and over and over and over again. One of the things that I just thought about when April was talking is that a mental health crisis for a human being, an individual, isn't a moment in time actually. It's a moment in time over a long trajectory of, of attempts to get recovery and care and treatment. And so the families hold the stress of a mental health crisis over a long period of time, even that what we might see in my field is blips or moments of that person in my life as a professional, but then I'm handing them back to a family that is really overwhelmed by how sick and um, how ill people can get if they don't get the kind of treatment that they actually absolutely need. And so I don't have answers about that. I even that, you know, I come from a state that probably has more um, funding per person for mental health and SUD issues, substance use disorder. Um, I do not have answers, but I do have ways of providing care. And I've been in the field for over 40 years. And so um, I wanna talk a little bit about that in a second. But first, Mono County. So we're a very, very large land mass. Um, and we have only just under 13,000 people. I'm sure we're losing a lot of people um, after this winter. I think people will be leaving the area because it just was too hard to manage. We have the one highway. Um, we're four hours from any residential or, or a psychiatric facility. And then we have a population breakdown where we're primarily white. Um, we have folks that are Native American and then the Latino Hispanic community is, is huge in our community because we are a tourist community and we um, have people working in the, in the hospitality fields. So our incorporated town, Mammoth, is, is where um, there's a large ski mountain there. Um, it's called Mammoth Mountain. And it is it fuels our folk, our tourism and focus. But it also creates an, an environment where um, a lot of the incorporated town funding goes towards the tourist. And very little actually is spent on the people that live here full time. The other issue that will happen is that because we're a tourist economy, we don't want those people, um, people come to out of mostly Los Angeles to here. There's a straight shoot shot up 395, the highway, to the Mono County and the Mammoth Lakes area. And they regularly complain about anyone that looks anything like what they're used to in a city. So anybody that might be unhoused here or looks like they might have a mental health issue, the town really um, wants them out of the town. Sometimes they'll move them into other counties, which isn't legal, but it does happen because they want people to have, quote, a good time and not have to worry about um, what they see in other areas. So it's just another example about how stigma plays out, I think, that people, the folks who have mental health issues, um, are human beings. They're doing their best to have a life. Um, they may need our help. They may not want our help. And then, you know, we're asked often to respond to certain types of issues that will be a crisis or they think or the law enforcement will think is a crisis. But in fact, um, really, it's just a person who's like in the town and but doesn't look like a tourist. And so they want us to, quote, do something. 
Okay, so we're so small here, and these are some pictures of the snow this year. Um, we don't have any network providers, so it's just us. I think very probably similar to your other your small counties near the Appalachian area. Um, we don't have urgent care. We have the one hospital. It's not a psychiatric hospital. We just have two pharmacies in the entire county. It serves that central area, not our outlying areas. We just have the one market, kind of a half market as well five stoplights. So it's always hard for me to kind of describe to people like what it means to be small and remote like we are. So these are some of the ways we have it. Um, we just have the one bus and we are really far away from everything. That's one way that we talk about it. All right. So um, one of the things that we have used and I, if I to the degree there are policy makers here is um, something that's been very important in being connected to our communities is we we really put at the center of our care that there's nothing about us without us. And what that means is that if we are making, I think government is very good at making policy and procedures um, that it thinks are helpful to the people and constituents that they serve but there rarely are the people that they're actually serving at the table to help them make those policies and procedures. I'll give you just a, an easy example. I've been the director here for 11 years. When I first became the director, I was given the task to do a better job of, quote, serving our underserved areas. So that's anything outside of, Mon outside of Mammoth Lakes, California. We have about 12 little hamlets that might have somewhere between 75 to 300 people. Um, the, they're all quite different from what each other. Some are connected to tribal nations, some are not. Um, they tend to be communities that are very tight knit. They use their church a lot for their um, engagement. They don't trust us at all. They don't wanna be a part of us at all. They tend to be more conservative than parts of California. And they think that government is, um, is a dangerous place to be. They've been either been exploited by government or they feel that government really shouldn't exist at all. And we're constantly trying to manage that. So I was given the, um, the directive from my board at that time to do a better job of serving underserved communities. So there's a place here in, in Mono County called Benton, California. It's, um, I think it has a maybe, I don't know if it still has a gas station. It does, it is connected to a tribe, the um, Paiute tribe out in Benton. And there's approximately 300 people that live out there. And it's very diverse in, in a particular way where it has people who can easily hide from the law. It has people that can easily have untreated mental health issues and, and survive okay. There is a way to have kind of dilapidated, but housing nevertheless out there. It does have severe winter, but we do have a number of people that move to Benton, California for the sake of being as far away from humans as they can possibly be. So when I went out, when I talked to other county um, folks here that have been with Mono County longer than I had, they told me that no one will show up in Benton because um, they don't quote like us or need us. And so I that was curious to me. And I asked some questions about how Mono County had tried in the past to go out there. Well, it turned out the way Mono County had gone out in Tibetan in the past was to go on a Tuesday at, at afternoon. They put up um, notices that talked about us coming out there on letterhead paper. So very government looking, very complicated language. Um, more technical kind of government language, if you will, not in Spanish, just in English, and nobody showed up. And so what we decided to do is have something on a Saturday that involved kids and families that we also served food because we had a suspicion, um, partly driven by the fact that my mom back in her heyday worked in um, communities and understood that if you if you bring food, people are more likely to come. And if you do have things for kids to do and it's not during the work week, that people are more likely to show up. So we had our first event 11 years ago. We had 50 people show up, which was remarkable. And we put up big poster boards that just said, what is cool about Benton? 
What are the strengths of Benton and what does Benton need? And we got so much feedback about what people felt they needed out in that area that felt very underserved to them. I had vast numbers of people come to me and basically, um, not in an aggressive way, but in a pretty big way, say, we know why you're here. You work for the government. You're just here to get some check boxes done. You just want you want to be able to say that you're serving the Native American population of people in our community because you came out here. We know that we're going to tell you what we want and you'll never come back until you need us again for your numbers. And that was also very curious to me. And I believed to them. So I said, hey, I'll make you a deal. We will do something every month that involves that is we will serve a dinner. It will involve kids. If you want to bring kids, it'll be a clean and sober event. And we'll see if people are interested. And they told me, there's no way you're going to do that. Sorry, the dogs are going to bark. Stop. And so we did. And we still have the event. We call it Dinner in a Movie. We do it once uh, every month out in the Benton area. Um, it's not very expensive. Uh, it allows us to create a community event where we don't show up as, quote, government. It has really increase the engagement that people have feeling with us um, related to the services that we have, but also just somebody to talk to. We also have a harm reduction uh, coalition here that's through my department. That's where we um, treat people who use drugs as people. We don't have the expectation that they will only get services from us if they commit to sobriety. We just want them to come back. And so that philosophy, again, of nothing about us without us, and please just come back, um, is the way in which we are able to get um, Narcan into these communities and also um, just have conversations with people that normally would not feel that they want to approach us. And that's been incredibly successful. But what it taught me as a white person and as a professional with a degree is that our job is to find a way to the people that we serve and listen over time very carefully about what they need and how they need it. So they may not be able to come directly to our offices. They may not want to see us um, in the field. They may not want to be seen with us. We shouldn't bring a, one of those white government cars out to the reservation because it always means trouble and discontent or that we're going to take children away or whatever they're worried about and whatever has occurred for them. Um, hold on one second. I got to do one thing here. Dogs. Sorry about that. So um, from a policy point of view, I think there's two things that are really important about this story. Number one is that if you are a policymaker and you are um, trying to sort out your funding, make sure that you are giving equal amounts of funding to the rural areas. Make sure that you really understand by listening with nothing about us without us to the people who actually provide the services in the rural areas. It's very different than an urban setting. It'll take, if I were called right now to go to the most Northern part of my County, it would take me two and a half hours to get there. And that's without snow or getting stuck behind RVs or, or road work. Again, we just have the one road. So um, I'm in a position where I can't meet my state requirements. The state requirement is that we have somebody physically there, a, a professional physically there for a crisis um, within 90 minutes. And that is absolutely and totally impossible in my county, um, even if we use peers, because we just don't have, we don't have the volume of crisis that allows my county to say, yes, we'll spend money on it. But it also creates um, a situation where we're being required to do something that we actually can do well in a in a way that isn't the way that the state has set it up. So that LA standard doesn't work in Mono County. That's super important to policymakers to really understand the impact. So when we get somebody who um, is having a mental health or SUD crisis or both, um, again, what we try to do is avoid any further trauma for that person to the degree that we can. 
And that means that we focus really strongly on wraparound services, utilizing our case managers and community supports, churches, um, peers, family members, um, anybody who's willing to help. We really work a lot with um, prevention and stigma reduction by fostering our individual relationships with people because we feel that if you create connection, then you have the opportunity to offer more to a person that might be in crisis or just maybe hopefully help out before you get to that point of crisis. We have the same issues that you do in, in um, Ohio, which is people with mental health issues are people and they have rights. And they sometimes have medical, they do have medical rights in California, it sounds like also in Ohio, to be able to um, self-determine what they're going to do around treatment. But if they have an illness that tells them that they don't have an illness, then we have a consistent problem. In Mono County, we really try to not have people scrape the bottom before they get the help that they need. But in the state of California, you have to be so involved in your illness and so have repetition after repetition after repetition of the cycle of the psychotic disorder that to the point where the brain really struggles to recover um, even with medication services because it's already been involved with with psychosis and the illness for so long and the other part about that that I think not that you all will forget this, but I, I do hope policymakers understand is it's traumatizing. People with severe mental health issues, people with persistent and severe diagnoses like schizophrenia, they're still a person. They're a person in there with a disease that's taking over the way that they think about the world and themselves. But inside there is still that human. And that human is registering everything that's happening to them. So an example would be I had to do in the jail. Um, we have a very small jail here. And in the jail, we had a fellow that had was just really struggling with schizophrenia. He was very, very, very ill. And they put him in a cage and they asked me to evaluate him. And so I went and met him and I knew his name. And he and I had a conversation about how he was doing and his, all, his entire conversation with me was about his delusions, about druids and wizards and devils and the whole thing. And he and he was aggressive and he would he looked scared. And um, I did my evaluation. He got sent away to a state hospital because he was incompetent to stand trial. And then when he came back, he said to me, and this will always matter to me in terms of my practice, he said, do you remember when I was in that cage? And I said, I do. And he said, uh, the thing I remember about it is you knew my name and you were kind and everybody else was just mad at me all the time. And I didn't understand why. And so that is an example that we, the people that we serve are people. They have an entire personality and experience going on inside of themselves. And while that's happening, even that they might have uh, aggressive behaviors or what other people would call crazy behaviors, they're actually a human being. And where those of you that are in this field and do this work, where you are an amazing people, is that you work really hard. It is so hard to sit and listen and hold space for somebody who's having the worst day of their life. Whether they're having delusions or they're suicidal, if you're sitting with a human being who is willing to talk to you or just sit with you, maybe not even look at you, about how they're doing in that moment. That is a gift that you're giving them. And I know because I know how hard that work is. It is a lot of work. It seems simple. I don't know about you all in Ohio, but in California, law enforcement, hospitals, community members feel like we have some special fairy dust that we use that we only use intermittently and we only use if we feel like it. They want us to, quote, do something about that guy over there that's suffering. And they think that we have some special powers to do that. The special power is that we treat people with dignity. We treat people with respect. And we do a lot of work in ourselves to be able to hold space to listen to that person over there that's suffering so we can help figure out how to give them some level of service and care in a system that is unbelievably broken. And so... For those of you that support 
the people that do the work, that are the line workers that go out, the peers that go out, your case managers, your therapists, whatever they're called in Ohio, they need more money, they need more support, and you need to figure out ways in your state to create more of those folks in your world so that you don't have people like me. I'm the only one. I get called by all kinds of people in my county to go do something about that suffering person. Well, I'm just one person. And I can. I also have to make sure I'm taking care of myself and so that I'm not so fried and burnt out from my work and traumatized by my work that I can't go back and hold space for the people that need us the most. And so support your people that do this work. It's vitally important. If you are one of the people who do the work, honor yourself. Hard work, really challenging and so rewarding and very important and very often because our system is so wrecked, we don't feel like we're doing enough, even that we're trying our best to do something. Um, peers are essential, as I know you know. Um, we, I don't want to. I don't need to read to you if, as, off of a PowerPoint. So, lastly, I'm available. I'm happy to talk about Meadow County and the way in which we do crisis intervention here. Um, one of the things that we're working on right now in Mono County is a mobile crisis response where a law enforcement official or a paramedic, we have paramedics in each of our little hamlets I talked to you about, can take an iPad to a person who is having or a family that are having a crisis. And then that iPad will connect immediately with one of our crisis workers, of which I am one. Um, so that we at least are able to do something in the moment because we're not always able to get there. Like I said, it could take up to two hours if we can even try to get there. The system is really broken. And there are many things that I think at a policy level you can start to look at to do differently, to support the people who are doing this work and support the families that need us so desperately to be available to be able to do the work to meet with the people that are having the crisis. Dignity, care, and kindness, and nothing without us. Those are my primary central parts about the way in which we do work here in Mono County. And I really thank you for your time. I thank all of you for being here um, and thanks. Thank you, Robin, excellent presentation. At this point, we are opening up for questions and answers. If you have a question, I'm going to ask you to put it in the Q&A box. Seeing no questions at this time, we're gonna be respectful to everybody's time. Feel free to continue to put your questions in the box. Robin is going to be with us um, throughout the webinar. So we might be able to entertain some questions. Actually, I see one coming through now. Elijah, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yeah, so we have a couple questions coming in actually. Um, Robin, so the first question we have is, what is the response by people in the community having uh, the crisis speaking on the iPad. I'm sorry, I missed the first part of that. What Say mm -hmm. the first part. So people are curious, what's the response like using the iPad? Um, you know, again, I think it's not perfect. Some people are fine with it. Um, research is showing that some people are more comfortable talking to somebody remotely than they are in person. So and we're modeling this over um, another county that does it, that has a really um, huge landmass and a lot of remote areas of people that are in crisis. So again, it's not a perfect solution. We're, we're still testing it. Um, it's, you know, again, I think in a broken system like we have, what we're trying to do is something that's better than nothing. And so right now we're looking at it as better than nothing. I will say that that it does um, it has brought our law enforcement, sheriff's department, and medics into training 
that they wouldn't normally get. And so that is also proven to be very good because sometimes they'll just call and say, hey, this isn't a crisis, but there's a fellow out here that we're concerned about. Can we run something by you? Or are you willing, you know, how do we get them connected to services or whatever? So, you know, I'm in this for the long haul. And though I know that the crisis workers, um, you're dealing with it in the moment. And I that's super important. I'm in it for the over a long period of time, trying to figure out all the different ways to create bridges through stigma. And this seems like it's going to be one of those, even that it might not address all our crisis needs. It is bringing our law enforcement and medic um, staff closer to understanding about how to deal with people that are struggling with a mental health issue or a substance use issue in the moment. Yeah, great. I hope Thank I answered you. the question. Yeah, no, I think that's good. Um, someone just asked if there's any recommendations for schools, youth um, within your community. For schools? Yeah. Um, again, I think one thing that we really, really try to do, and again, over the long haul, it is starting to be really um, working, is finding community members from the communities that we're serving that I am not a part of or certain staff are not a part of. So finding people in our different communities, tribal communities, some of the little hamlets that we have, people who have lived there for generations over time, um, who are very, very used to taking care of each other and basically kind of they care for their, themselves and they don't want our intervention, but sometimes ask for it. So we find that if we can find peers, particularly, or people who are who would like to start at the at the entry level of a, of one of our government jobs, so we can train and build them. And you know, we have some folks that are going to a master's level classes now who've been with us for like the last five or six years, wow. who started off with. Um, and we have money differently than you, but I would highly recommend that policymakers create ladders of education so people can get to the points where um, they're able to provide the full scope of services that peers aren't always allowed to do, at least in California. Um, but what we try to do is get people within those communities to, we give them either training or just support or connection to us if they need us so that we're not coming in as foreigners in a way that we're actually supporting people that are already there on the ground and already live within the communities that they're trying to serve. I will say the other side of that coin is um, and living and working in the same community is a challenge. So we have workers who, you know, they live in a community of, let's say, 175 people, give or take, and um, they are the point person for the department. They are the point person if there's a crisis and they might get called out to a crisis for their cousin or their next door neighbor or somebody that um their kids play with or whatever. And so there's all matter of boundary issues and trying to have a life and also be in the community when you're serving people and knowing things that you can't talk about, like all of the HIPAA things, the way in which that creates a way in which we can't communicate, we don't get to belong to the community that we live in. We talk about that as a department regularly and often because that's another way I think we have to really support the people that we work with so that they can continue to do the work that they're really good at. That's great. And not a question, just someone said um, they wanted to thank you for your passion and genuine care for those struggling with mental illness. So thank you, Robin, for taking the time to answer these questions. Hey, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. It's awesome. I love hearing what you're all doing. Thank you. Uh, Fonda? Once again, Robin, thank you. At this point, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Marilyn Sempilo. Dr. Sempilo is a psychologist with Cleveland Clinic. Her work has included a focus on health equity and working with non-English speaking individuals. Dr. Sempilo will discuss equity considerations and crisis response, an agenda for addressing language barriers. 
Thank you so much. Um, I'm hopeful that my video is working well. Hopefully that my sound is working well and I am going to work on sharing my slides. So um, first and foremost, just thank you, um, Robin. I really appreciate your uh, talk as well. Um, I will be hitting on some things that I think you alluded to as well. So let me just get my screen working here. And see. Okay. And can anyone tell me if they can see my presentation or if they see it in a different mode? We see it in a different mode. It's a different mode. Okay. Yeah. This sometimes happens. So I apologize. I'm going to get this right. There we go. All right. Awesome. Okay. So thank you all. I just got this dual screen set up, so it gets a little confusing for me. Um, but thank you all uh, for having me. Um, so um, as Fonda mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about working with um, limited English proficient populations or communities or individuals just facing language barriers. So we're just going to go ahead and jump and get started. Um, just so that folks are aware, I have no conflicts to disclose. Um, I wanted to sort of go over a brief overview of the objectives, um, but for some reason it is sort of showing up oddly on my screen. So hopefully um, this comes up well. Here we go. So overviews, we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of addressing language needs um, and equity considerations for this population. We're going to talk about recommendations, both at the provider level, also at clinic or your agency or institutional level. And then we're also going to talk about some structural recommendations, um, because what we know is that addressing language barriers really does take a structural sort of systemic approach. And then we're going to talk a little bit about a call to action. So I'm going to talk about some things we can start doing right away um, as we start to make some progress um, in this work. So to start, I want us to consider um, just this case study. So I'm just going to read briefly a little bit of it. Um, so this has to do, this is the case study of M. Um, it's a 42-year-old Hispanic Latina female with limited English proficiency, experiencing breathing difficulty, accelerated heart rate, dizziness, um, and currently on the floor um, after collapsing. Um, the contextual factors is that this female was experiencing significant psychosocial stress prior to the episode um, and present at the scene are extended family members um, of this particular individual who also um, have limited English proficiency. A 911 call was placed by a 13-year-old adolescent female um, relative who is fluent in English, um, and paramedics arrived with the adolescent female serving as interpreter to sort of help facilitate communication during sort of this crisis episode. Paramedics treated the adult at scene, and no further intervention was deemed necessary um, after that encounter. However, uh, several hours later, the 42-year-old Hispanic Latina female um, did make an attempt at deliberate self-harm. Uh, you're probably noting some questions, some concerns and considerations with this case, and it's not uncommon, frankly, for younger folks who may have greater fluency with English to be relied upon for facilitating communication for limited English proficient family members. And you might have even encountered similar situations in your recent past. Um, from my experience working with limited English proficient families, this could be something that happened yesterday. Um, and the reality is, is that this case is actually from nearly 30 years ago, because I'm the 13-year-old adolescent female in this case study. Um, I use this case study to illustrate not just an example of how language barriers pose great concerns in crisis situations, but also to tell you a little bit about the experience and perspective I bring to this work and this presentation. Um, as I mentioned, I am the 13-year-old um, who's described in this case study or part of this case study. Um, the 42-year-old happened to be a relative of mine. Um, and as I was growing up, I served as the interpreter often for my family members um, who did have limited English proficiency. In this particular crisis, or in this particular situation, there were a lot of um, questions and concerns after the fact, right? Did I do a poor job uh, interpreting um, because um, my female family member um, did make an attempt at deliberate self-harm? She is okay and doing well. Um, but during this particular episode, there were a lot of questions about potentially, you know, had I done something wrong? Um, had the paramedics not communicated to me or did I not understand and couldn't interpret well? Did I miss something? Did something in the translation get lost or an in interpretation get lost because I'm 13 and don't necessarily 
maybe understand the gravity of the question that they're asking me. Um, so a lot of questions and obviously concerns, um, but this is something, this is an experience that I had that I bring to this work in thinking about what are the ways that we can try and think about how better to create a systemic solution um, to some of these cases. And obviously we are, everyone on this call, um, they are individuals and so don't necessarily, may not necessarily have within their own individual sphere of influence, the power to create that systemic change. But there are things that we all can do. Um, and that's sort of the goal um, to try and help um, for this presentation today. I also want to use this um, case study as just an opportunity to sort of tell you a little bit about myself, because I think it's important that um, when we're talking about um, different communities and health equity, that we also understand that every presenter, including myself, comes with our own personal lived experience and biases that potentially um, are part of our presentation, right? So I'm just sort of owning that. Um, so I am um, the daughter of, of immigrants. I come from a family of immigrants and refugees, um, men, many of whom have limited English proficiency. Um, on the one half of my family, I'm a multicultural family, so on the one half of my family, um, they are Latino, um, from Peru and Cuba. On the other side of my family, um, they're all Filipino. Uh, so I navigate a very multicultural world. Um, and obviously we're very American as well. Um, so that's a little bit of my history. I sort of grew up in Washington, D.C., right outside Washington, D.C. and Maryland um, in a predominantly African-American um, county um, and went to a predominantly African-American high school. Um, and I loved it. I uh, love PG County, Maryland. Um, and so that's a little bit of the sort of the cultural makeup of, of uh, what I bring to the table. Um, I am a psychologist by training. I also have my uh, master's in public health. Um, and so I sort of take a population focused sort of approach to my work. Um, and I try to really focus on health disparities um, and promoting health equity is a big component of my work, both as a professional interest, but also as a very personal interest, um, invested interest, as a lot of my family um, belong to different communities um, that have historically been underserved. Just kind of want to just lay sort of that um, that groundwork there. Um, so uh, the objective, uh, first objective for today is just to give an overview of sort of the importance of addressing language needs and sort of the equity considerations um, with that. So I want to just take a moment for folks to reflect on how their clinics, agencies, or organizations currently address language barriers in crisis response. So this is not like a poll question. There's nowhere where you have to put your answer. Um, but I just want folks to think about it. Clearly, these are the only options listed here, but these are just common options. These aren't necessarily the only options that exist. Disclaimer that this question is just meant to get folks to reflect on what current practices are. The appropriateness or degree of acceptability of the choices here quite varies. Um, the unknown option may seem odd, um, but it's there for a reason. Um, if folks don't know what options are available, that itself is important data. I'm going to pause here just for a few seconds for folks to just think about their answers. Again, just generally, what does your agency, organization, institution, currently do to address language barriers in crisis response. And your answers don't go anywhere. Again, these are just sort of answers to keep in mind um, and it helps frame our discussion for today. So it's gonna take a few seconds, let folks sort of think. All right. Um, so it's important that we also understand that language barriers and its impact on care is not only an individual or agency problem, rather it's a systemic problem. So let's take, um, Let's take a look at some recent happenings in Maryland, again, which is my home state, um, as an example. So these are findings from a pair of civil rights and advocacy groups, including the Public Justice Center, a civil rights and legal services organization, along with the Center for Salud Health and Opportunity for Latinos or Central SOL, a Johns Hopkins based community advocacy group. And what they showed that is when looking at sort of the access to mental health services for children, they found that children in need of mental health services were not receiving interpretation services despite need that children were denied services due to language barriers, or informed providers did not have capacity to provide services for them, again, due to language barriers, um, and were even placed on wait lists for services that really no one was monitoring this wait list because there was a lack of availability for interpreter services. So while the scope of the problem isn't exactly clear, these were some of the findings that they found. Um, and the report highlighted three very specific case studies where um, these were some of the issues that were um, viewed or observed. Um, 
what they also found was that providers were receiving federal assistance. So in theory, they should be providing uh, meaningful access to care. Um, but there was a lack of guidance from state health officials and a lack of enforcement for that. And so there was sort of this gap between what the expectation is and what was actually happening. But these examples highlight what might be happening in many states across the country and calls to light really that significant chasm between what should be provided to individuals with limited English proficiency um, and what is actually provided. So in order to address language barriers that members of our communities face, we have to better understand the basics, right? So first, let's define what we mean by folks who face language barriers. When folks experience language barriers that prevents effective engagement in navigating systems of services, we say that they have limited English proficiency. So limited individuals with limited English proficiency are persons for whom English is not their primary language, persons who have limited ability to read, write, speak, and understand English and individuals with hearing or vision impairments that affects the abilities um, that we've just outlined. Um, and this definition includes individuals with sensory impairments who are deaf or hard of hearing and communicate using American Sign Language, have speech impairments, um, or whom are blind and have visual impairments as well. When we talk about limited English proficient populations nationally, the greatest number of limited English proficient speakers by language are actually Spanish, um, Spanish, Chinese, and Vietnamese. Um, and really, when we think about um, how they're classifying this, it's for persons who report speaking English less than very well as classified by the U.S. Census Bureau. So when you fill out the U.S. Census, there's a question that asks about your comfort in speaking English. And if you um, designate that your comfort level is less than very well, um, you are classified um, sort of as part of the group that has more limited English proficiency. So what does this mean for healthcare? Well, really with the passage of healthcare reform and more previously uninsured Americans have access to health insurance. Um, so it's anticipated that healthcare facilities are going to encounter a more diverse patient population than ever before. Um, and these numbers actually likely underestimate the number of patients, um, number of patients from diverse backgrounds that we see um, because many individuals um, who are undocumented or individuals um, who have mixed status, for example, um, may also present to the healthcare system and not necessarily capture in some of these numbers. So as we look towards the future, the provision of appropriate services will take on greater importance. Um, and really as healthcare and behavioral healthcare, mental healthcare entities, we really have to be prepared to provide safe, culturally appropriate um, and quality um, care um, for individuals from diverse social, cultural and linguistic backgrounds. So closer to home, um, we look, can look at the Midwest, which also includes Ohio, um, and see the languages with the highest number of LEP, um, limited, English, in, limited English proficient speakers by language. Um, and you see some similarities to sort of the national picture with the top two languages, again, being Spanish and Chinese, but Arabic is the language with the third highest number of LEP speakers um, in the Midwest. And even closer to home, the most common languages spoken at home other than English here in Ohio are generally Spanish, sort of Indo-European, so like French, Russian, um, and then your Asian um, languages as well. Um, of these languages, the ones with the largest percentage of limited English proficiency, some of the data is a little bit mixed, um, but we have um, a lot of your Asian languages are sort of represented in that mix. Um, and then obviously we have some other languages as well. So how do language barriers impact healthcare for limited English um, proficient communities? Um, so first and foremost, it really impacts identif identification of care needs. It is difficult to be able to um, really engage in early identification and early intervention um, when language barriers prevent individuals from accessing or navigating healthcare systems, right? So if you're having trouble just entering a healthcare system, if you think about how we make an appointment, just like calling and making an appointment, it's very seamless for us individuals who are uh, fluent and proficient in English. Um, but if you're someone with limited English proficiency, even just making that appointment or even just sort of navigating that initial system, that point of contact is going to be challenging without the appropriate resources. So more individuals who have or who experience limited English proficiency are going to be less likely to um, enter or engage in the healthcare system, which makes those identification of care needs um, more of a challenge. Um, obviously accessing care. So we talked about like just identifying needs. Now we talk about like, again, entering the healthcare system and how do you navigate that system to access care? That in and of itself is very challenging. Again, if you think about like how 
challenging it might be to travel to a foreign country um, and just ask some basic questions like, you know, where's the nearest bathroom or where um, is the nearest like air conditioned building? Um, the only reason I'm thinking about that is because I was in France recently. It was very, very hot and I wanted an air conditioned building to sit in for a little bit. Um, and just sort of asking those kinds of questions that are very basic. When you think about like healthcare or in a crisis or when things are very serious from a medical, physical or mental health care, mental health care standpoint, um, thinking about how do we access care when, again, services may not be delivered in a way that provides that meaningful access. And it also obviously impacts quality of care. Um, so in terms of the linguistic and cultural appropriateness of that care, if we're unable to really communicate effectively and understand one's needs, understands one's preferences, health beliefs, those kinds of things. It impacts the quality of care potentially that someone receives. Um, there is some research to suggest that, for example, um, individuals with limited English proficiency who uh, present to the emergency room for depart, for example, um, are often um, provide often their care plan is a little bit more complicated because of the ineffectiveness or inefficiency um, due to those language barriers. So they may be admitted more often, they may experience more, undergo more medical workup um, and unnecessary workup. Um, and that's a function of potentially not having that ability to effectively communicate needs um, in those environments. So when we think about language-based inequities, so what is really um, the differences or disparities in healthcare, um, there's problem identification. So even just understanding like what the problem is or what the uh, primary issue um, is in terms of the presenting concern, often it's um, sort of termed as it's the difficulty with identifying identifying the problem is due to being the individual being due a poor historian, quote unquote poor historian, which means just an ineffective way of communicating like what their history has been. But that's not necessarily the appropriate description, right? Because the poor historian comes from the fact that there are barriers to them being able to communicate um, effectively about their history and the symptoms and sort of what they're experiencing. Um, one's understanding of treatment plans and appropriate treatment um, can be challenging um, when language barriers present itself. So again, there's a lot of research that suggests that even just sort of knowing um, prescription medication instructions can be very challenging um, when information is not provided um, in a way that um, someone understands clearly. Um, satisfaction for the patient, but also for the provider in an encounter um, decreases um, due to um, language barriers. And then the incidence of errors or compromises in patient safety um, go up um, when we have concerns with um, incidence of errors. Um, so considerations in crisis. So when we think about what are the things that, so all of that exists even when there's not a crisis necessarily going on, just like general healthcare, um, when we think about language-based um, disparities. But when we think about crisis, there are some unique factors that happen in crisis situations that then up the stakes a little bit or create even more of um, an urgency to really ensure that we're understanding folks correctly. So we know that there's a high level of stress and distress that you have to navigate with any crisis situation. We know that there's difficulty communicating and understanding, again, in general, but then you heighten that with sort of the stress and distress that you experience in a crisis situation. Um, feelings that uh, folks are caught off guard. So as a provider, as a responder, um, whoever is sort of responding to the situation, feelings of being caught off guard with, you know, how do I navigate this when someone is not necessarily able to communicate as effectively as they would like to with me? And then navigating the involvement of others in a crisis situation, sort of as like, for example, the case study we started off with, which was my family, um, there were a lot of other people involved. Um, there was obviously myself as the adolescent, um, but then there were several other family members. And so you're navigating not only the individual on by chance, but you're also navigating potentially other people who might be involved or present uh, during the crisis response, of whom also there may be some individuals who also experience language barriers in that way. So how do language barriers impact care for individuals with limited English proficiency during a crisis or mental health emergency? So first and foremost, it's hard to understand your needs and your rights. Um, so as a responder, again, or as the provider, you may have difficulty understanding what they need or what they need in that particular moment in time. And the individual may also have trouble communicating their needs, but they also may have under trouble understanding their rights in any situation, right? So their right to treatment, their right to, um, if it's a, you know, a response with law enforcement, what are their rights within that um, specific circumstance as well? Um, and that's critical, right? We can make, and we can make a situation much worse. We can escalate a situation much, much more quickly than we want to um, without that understanding. 
Um, if you're trying to communicate critical information, which again is very critical, obviously, in a crisis situation, how um, that potentially negatively impacts individuals if they're not able to uh, understand that information and you as a provider or responder are unable to communicate that um, information effectively, which can result in denial of services, delay in services, inappropriate services, or ineffective services. And then obviously providing culturally responsive crisis intervention and de-escalation is compromised when there's a language barrier or linguistic uh, uh, factor um, that isn't accounted for or isn't addressed. So what are the barriers to supports for limited English uh, proficient persons? So when we think about the options, right? And again, that one question I asked you to reflect on is not necessarily um, uh, reflect all of the different choices that are available to folks, um, but it does sort of outline some of the options that are available. But even with some options that are available, they're not always utilized. So um, again, I just want to go through a, a case study um, or an example from my own personal life. So this actually happened two years ago. Um, my uh, grandmother was actually in the hospital um, and she had, um, has limited English proficiency. And I was I called her on the phone because I was out of state and I called to see how she was doing. She was in the hospital. She had her phone present. Um, and while I was um, talking to her on the phone that she was in a big hospital system um, in the D.C. area, um, while I was on the phone with her, I heard the doctor or the physician um, come into her room. Um, and I don't know where she had the phone. Um, what I do know is the provider didn't know I was on the phone, but um, the provider came in and was trying to communicate to my grandmother about um, basically her symptoms and then her like medication, what was going to happen next with her medication. Um, and he was trying very hard, um, but he was doing it in English and my grandmother was not understanding. And I remember just sitting on the phone um, and, and trying to yell so my grandmother could hear because I think she put the phone down, trying to yell to her to ask for an interpreter um, in Spanish. Um, and I'm just sort of there listening to this encounter, and I know that there are interpreters available, but for whatever reason, the interpreter is not being brought in into the um, encounter. And then at some point, my, my grandmother picks up the phone, and so the physician realizes that there's someone on the phone, and I tell my grandmother I need to speak with him. And I speak with him, and I tell him that she's not understanding anything that's being told to her, um, that any encounter with her where that information is being communicated needs to have um, an interpreter present. Um, and he sort of asked me to interpret and, and, and in my professional role of sort of helping to try and advocate for her, I said, no, I'm, I'm unable to do that actually. I need you to get an interpreter um, for this encounter. Um, I cer certainly could have interpreted for just the benefit of that particular um, encounter, but I wanted to set a precedent that she needed that because I can't always be on the phone. Um, and so that's, again, another example from just two years ago of resources I know being available, but them not being utilized. And so what are some of the barriers to when um, some of these resources? So we know that sometimes there is inadequate availability of interpreters. There are just not enough interpreters for all of the individuals who require one. Um, Sometimes when there are sort of backup options like telephone or um, language lines or video interpreters, um, sometimes there's connectivity problems, sometimes there's delays, um, and so that can also um, cause barriers to providing those supports. Um, sometimes it's personal judgment and preferences, so providers or responders who um, are pressed for time um, may, for whatever reason, and there's research to suggest that they make personal judgments about this may not be an encounter where I need to use an interpreter or I need to go ahead and find those resources. Um, and sometimes it's due to time, right? Um, it's just provider and time constraints. There's research to suggest that sometimes those um, decisions are made based on um, based on those time constraints in a way that doesn't necessarily reflect truly um, the best culturally and, and linguistically appropriate care. So these are just some of the barriers that when supports may be available, we're still not necessarily utilizing them. Um, and so when we think about um, not providing or not responding to one's language needs, um, it contributes to ongoing behavioral health inequity. So um, I don't, I know this is preaching to the choir a little bit because it's the whole point of this crisis academy, um, but inequity obviously being the difference that results from systemic, avoidable, unfair, unjust, and preventable very barriers that limit or constrain the opportunity for an individual to reach their full potential. I highlight avoidable, unfair, unjust, and preventable because the idea is these are things that there are things that we can do about um, these factors. Um, and 
that, that's sort of the question, sort of the, the point of this presentation is what can be done? Um, when we think about language, really language access um, is a social determinant of health. If you think about healthcare access and quality, which is sort of in the upper right um, of this figure here, um, it does impact healthcare access and quality. So that certainly is um, a social determinant of health. Um, when we think about our social determinants of health, um, the way I sort of like to think about it is social determinants of health are sort of these leaves on a flower, right? Um, but when we think about it, for some reason, um, what's in the soil or sort of the social structures or hierarchies or, you know, structural factors, systemic factors that really impact the expression of those of those leaves, right? So someone's health care um, access may be um, may be wonderful and maybe green in terms of very healthy, a very healthy um, a healthy experience with the healthcare system. But if we have a language barrier that's not being addressed, then that leaf essentially um, suffers, um, right? And so we end up potentially negatively impacting their healthcare. Um, so we think about relevant laws um, and limited English proficient individuals, just sort of want to kind of go briefly through just some of the laws that really sort of govern providing meaningful access for these individuals. So under executive order, recipients are required to provide um, individuals with limited English proficiency meaningful access to their programs and services. When we think about the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA in Section 504, um, protections are supposed to apply equally to LEP individuals with disabilities um, or individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. Um, limited English proficient um, individuals may be entitled to language services or communication assistance um, for a service benefit or program that receives any kind of federal assistance. And entities may also need to provide like auxiliary aids for individuals with disabilities at no additional cost to them um, to ensure that effective communication. Um, so uh, for individuals with like um, impairments in terms of hearing, vision, or speech. Um, and auxiliary, auxiliary aids can include the um, use of qualified interpreters, but then also assistive listening headsets, television captioning, telecommunication, braille materials, large print materials, sort of um, a lot of variety of in terms of like what is needed to access care. And then Section um, 1557 of the Affordable Care Act prohibits discrimination on the basis of national origin in healthcare. One form of national origin is um, discrimination or failure to provide meaningful access to individuals with limited English proficiency um, when required by law. So there are laws to govern um, the, the need to respond to individuals' language needs. What that means is when we think about, you'll hear in those laws, there's a lot of um, a lot of references to federal assistance. So programs or services that receive federal assistance or individuals who receive federal assistance. Um, what that means is when we're talking about providing meaningful access, um, it's usually going to um, be state agencies who receive federal assistance, local agencies or local departments of health, if you use so well, nonprofit agencies who receive funding that is governed by federal funds, so block grants, things like that. And then subcontractors, individuals who contract with these different entities to provide services. But again, that funding um, is received through federal funds and, and state funds. So under the executive order, again, recipients of federal monies are required to provide in individuals with limited English proficiency and meaningful access to their programs and services. So that's sort of the backstory, back history of everything, um, just, just sort of a, that overview. Now I want to talk a little bit about recommendations. And again, what I'm going to break recommendations down is into um, three different uh, spheres. Individual sphere, your clinic agency institution sphere, if you think about like, I might say clinic, it's just a proxy for sort of the larger entity that you work for. And then structural um, considerations or structural recommendations. So in, the, so in order to improve support for individuals with limited English proficiency um, in any situation, but particularly when it comes to crisis situations, um, we have to assess provider perceptions and understanding of language access support. I can't tell you how many times I do work with individuals in different agencies who don't actually know what all of the supports are available for providing or responding to language access needs. And then it's not just enough to know about them. Then we have to provide adequate training to address language barriers during crises. So again, it's a heightened um, situation, high stress, high distress with multiple factors, things that you're trying to navigate all at once. And so it's a unique circumstance. And how do you then utilize um, supports in that environment or within that context? So providing additional training for individuals. In terms of clinic or agency considerations, um, really, we have to think about systemic change to support and support consistent language access um, and then build an infrastructure that actually supports that access, particularly in crisis and mental health emergencies. So I think it's about being very intentional about saying, OK, in crises or in mental health emergencies, 
this is sort of our language access plan, right? And then structural considerations is really advocating for increased accountability and enforcement. So if you think back to that Maryland case study or the case study from Maryland, which was just recently, um, that argues for just more consistent monitoring, more consistent accountability in terms of how and to what extent we're providing those services. Um, and again, in just improved infrastructure for consistent implementation. Agencies don't exist on their own. They require funding to help support um, the services that they provide. That means from a structural level or more of a um, systemic level, providing sufficient support and funding and resources for um, uh, supports for individuals with limited English proficiency. So let's think about what this like actually looks like in practice, right? So on an individual level, as I mentioned, increased awareness of language access resources and then increased training with utilizing those language access resources that might also involve increasing training for working with interpreters. So what I understand a little bit about folks working with interpreters is a lot of times no one receives training on actually how to work with interpreters. It's just sort of an expectation of here, you have an interpreter, you're going to interpret this encounter, they're just going to repeat everything that you say in their the um, target language. And then um, they will uh, communicate for the patient on their behalf back to you. Um, but there is actually training um, available and training that should be done for individuals on how to work with interpreters because there are best practices, including like a pre-session meeting, a debrief meeting afterwards in terms of working with interpreters. It's a little bit beyond the scope of obviously of this presentation to talk about best practices, but that's an example of training to the resources so folks are more comfortable and likely more willing to utilize those resources um, in, in those situations. And then obviously it's always a, an important component to emphasize practicing cultural humility. So in um, working with any uh, individual, um, it's always important to keep sort of that um, humble sort of approach um, in terms of thinking about the individual being the expert on their own needs, particularly when there is a language barrier, sort of understanding that you're really working from sort of a deficit in terms of that understanding. And so really trying even harder to ensure that you're understanding from their perspective what is going on or what the situation is. In terms of the clinic and agency, you can identify language access gaps. So every agency entity should have a language access plan. But as I mentioned, it really should intentionally also focus on what is the plan for a crisis or emergent situation, um, because that that can be a little bit different, right? There, we don't necessarily have time for delays potentially in those situations. And so what is a language access plan for um, a crisis? Um, and then we have to create and update those language ac access plans, which means these plans really have to be dynamic and strategic in that way, meaning that over time, we should be improving language access. I know these aren't overnight fixes. I know we don't just like, you know, create interpreters or in-person interpreters or um, materials or uh, translated materials into appropriate languages just overnight. This takes work. It takes a systemic sort of approach to change. Um, but part of that is having a plan for ongoing change, right? So a plan that you revisit, a plan that gets updated, and a plan that changes as a function of what the needs are. And then you develop policies um, for consistent implementation of said plan, right? So again, there's some level of accountability there and some level of monitoring and enforcement that ensures that what we say we're going to do is actually being done in practice. Because again, if we think back to uh, the case study I mentioned, um, the Maryland case study, you know, my, my story about my grandma in the hospital, there are things that are expected to happen, doesn't mean they're actually happening. In terms of structural, again, is that increased accountability for entities who receive um, funds. It's improved monitoring and enforcement on that level, and then providing funding and support for resources like we talked about. So how can we improve language access um, for specific crises? So one of the things is sort of thinking about this as on a clinical level is doing geographical scanning. So one is important point is we have to know what languages are being serviced in our community, right? And that changes, and that changes over time. It can change very quickly. And so it's important to do what we call like geographical scanning, where you sort of take um, uh, you sort of take the temperature, if you will, of your community to determine what languages um, you're servicing or need to be servicing. Um, having that language access plan for crises, and then really partnering with community agencies. A lot of our communities who have historically been underserved by the healthcare system will have sort of their go-to social service agencies or community-based organizations, the folks who do sort of the boots on the ground, grassroots work, of really trying to ensure that the folks in their community have access to the resources and supports that they need, really partnering with them to, one, to ensure that we're amplifying the needs of the 
um, individuals with limited English proficiency or that community within that community, but then also partnering with them on potentially helping leverage their resources, right? So if they already have established connections and established trust with that community, they may also already have um, folks who work with them in terms of providing interpretation services or translation services or um, uh, other language access services. And so can we help support, amplify, leverage those resources so that they um, can work in concert with your organization to help meet the needs of that community, right? So um, for example, I used to work in, or used to live in Kansas and Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, one of the um, programs that we had was really partnering with a social service agency who provided um, language um, interpretation um, in crises. So they, the education, I'm sorry, the funding came from the organization to that social service agency to provide that funding for folks that they had already staffed. They just took on a different role with this additional funding. And so it's really about figuring out, are there ways to partner with community organizations to not only maybe bridge those gaps, but then also help develop community-based responses to crises, which we'll talk about just in a little bit. Um, obviously, from a structural standpoint, we need to update guidance um, when it comes to enforcement, obviously provide funding for crisis supports. And for some states, we have like, we keep like resource lists or keep resource banks for pro the provision of services. And so ensuring that we have updated resource lists on which entities provide um, uh, language access services, um, does mobile crisis, does, you know, this crisis organization, this crisis service, um, you know, making sure that we know that the text line, the crisis text line, the national line, they all provide um, potential bilingual um, counselors to, to respond um, or to answer those calls. And so just ensuring that we're providing updated lists to um, the different organizations that work within the state. Um, and then as, on an individual level, is being conscious of common pitfalls or barriers during crisis. So as I mentioned, um, in the example with my grandmother, common pitfalls would be likely time. Um, that physician may just have felt like time, uh, he was running late on time, couldn't wait for the interpreter. So what are the likely pitfalls or likely factors that might play a role in whether or not you as an individual utilize the appropriate services, right? I know we all want to utilize the appropriate services, but we're also, as I mentioned, we're also human and sometimes our biases, sometimes our um, time constraints, sometimes the you know, nature of the, the moment or the environment can cause us to make different choices than we would typically make. And so just being conscious of those common pitfalls um, and what those barriers are during crises. Um, and then increased comfort with addressing language needs during crisis. I think it's about sort of what can you do to be more comfortable as an individual within what's in your sphere of control um, in doing and during crisis. And we're going to talk about some of the individual um, things that we can do now. So when we talk about language needs, we also have to talk about nonverbals. Um, and nonverbals are important when responding to crisis. So maintaining non-threatening nonverbals. So using a calm voice tone. So tone translates. So just ensuring that your tone is calm. Being mindful of your your facial expression. So we communicate a lot non-verbally with our face. I'm told a lot that I don't hide my face well. So I have to be very mindful of my facial reactions to um, things that might be might generate, you know, a very strong reaction for me. Um, be mindful of eye contact. Um, maintaining consistent, like non, like ongoing consistent eye contact is not necessarily a helpful thing in certain circumstances and with certain within certain cultures. So being mindful of those sort of cultural um, uh, preferences um, when working with some of our communities. Give space, again, space translates. So respecting personal space um, and maintaining a safe distance, not only for the individual who's in crisis, but also for yourself. And avoid sudden movements. So neutral to relaxed posture um, and any slow movements, are, any mov movements are done slowly or you let them know you're going to be making a movement, sort of that um, warning, if you will, um, that you're going to be moving or shifting in some capacity. Um, sorry, I'm trying to go forward, but it's not quite good. There we go. Language loadings and responding to crisis. So it's also to understand that when we think about how we respond to crisis, um, when we're working with an interpreter or working, whether it's an iPad, whether it's a video interpreter, whether it's a language line, that how we still communicate, um, even though the content of what we are saying may be in, being interpreted, that still there are things that we can do in controlling the 
portions of our encounter that do have language loadings. So demonstrating empathy and a non-judgmental stance. You can communicate that in sort of the words that you're using um, that are being interpreted to an individual. You can express support and concern, and you can do that again, like uh, verbally, non-verbally in certain ways, active listening. So that's really important when we're working with um, someone with language needs because um, active listening sort of reflects that you're understanding what is being communicated and that there's no misinterpretation or misunderstanding. So if someone says, you know, I lost my job, I'm feeling hopeless, um, active listening would then respond and say, sounds like um, you've been going through a lot. There's a lot of stressful things happening and you're feeling pretty hopeless right now. So just sort of that active listening to ensure that that understanding is there. Asking how you can help. So um, instead of assuming that this is what is needed, asking that individual um, how you can help. And then also setting reasonable limits at a um, in crisis that we do have to set some reasonable limits for the purposes of safety and such. Um, and so setting those limits as reasonable. Um, and then we have to also think about culture and limited English proficiency. So um, what is the role of culture in crisis? So not only are we thinking about language um, concerns or linguistic needs, but we also need to think about the culture um, for that individual in that community, right? So when we're thinking about populations with limited English proficiency, there's a, the culture of that, of limited English proficiency, but there's also generally culture, just like with any individual that they bring to the table as well. So thinking about the role of culture in crisis, cross-cultural issues impacting crisis situations. So you yourself as a provider also bring with you culture to the table. And so your awareness of your own um, uh, you know, blind spots, your awareness of your own biases and your awareness of your own culture um, will be important in navigating uh, crisis situations um, that have those cross-cultural factors. Um, seeing culture as strength and culture as curative. So understanding that every individual in every culture um, has inherent strengths and has inherent assets that they bring to the table. And are there ways to leverage those in a crisis situation or sort of note those and sort of emphasize those in a crisis situation as well? And then just again, by doing that, we're just more culturally responsive um, during a crisis. We are attending to the cultural factors that are in place along with some of these language um, access needs as well. Um, it's important to understand that there are cultural variations in language as well. So um, talking about or mentioning um, suicide may not translate as well or may not be something that someone will respond to um, in the way that um, you intend in order to get a full assessment or a full picture of what's going on. So cultural variations in language, these are just some other ways to ask about suicidal thoughts that may um, be helpful. So have you ever felt like your family and friends would be better off without you? Have you ever felt like no one would care if you weren't around anymore? Um, have you ever wished something would end your life or someone would end your life? Um, and do you feel like you don't deserve to live? So again, just thinking about cultural variations in language and how um, thoughts of suicide or suicide are viewed in certain cultures that may reflect or may impact how someone responds. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I'll ask kind of a straightforward question about suicide. The answers will be no, but they will endorse answers to a lot of these other questions. Um, so again, just sort of thinking about cultural variations in language in that way. From a system agency standpoint, we think about, again, that strategic planning or sort of the language access plan. So really just sort of thinking about this as a, as a goal. So language access in crises, like this is our goal, let's make a plan to improve our services over time, right? So we start with sort of defining your vision and goals. Why is language access important? What is our ideal state? Like if everything, you know, we could control everything and we could have unlimited resources at our disposal, what would be our ideal state in terms of our functioning? Um, what is your current state though? What is the current state at your agency or clinic or organization in terms of being able to address those language access needs in crisis? What are the strengths that your agency has? What are the weaknesses? What are the opportunities? And what are the threats to being able to meet the needs uh, consistently? Strategic priorities, where are we now and how do we get where we need to be? So where are we now currently when we think about that ideal state? Where are we now in relation to that ideal state? What do we need in order to get to our closer to our ideal state? Um, and how to translate strategic priorities to action. So when you identify these strategic priorities, these are the things that we need to do to provide better um, appropriate linguistic care. Um, how do you then translate that to an actionable step that you can take, right? And what do you focus on first? So obviously we have to prioritize um, as you go. And then how do you measure progress and make adjustments as needed, right? And so once you've got a plan sort of in place and you're taking those actionable steps, 
revisiting the plan and sort of measuring, okay, how are we doing? Is this plan working as intended? Are we making progress? And do we need to make adjustments? Are there changes? And so when I say like a uh, language access plan for crisis, that this has to be a dynamic and strategic plan, it's something that you revisit and it guides your ongoing work, right? Um, it's also important to focus on community-centered crisis responses in terms of addressing um, particularly individuals with limited English proficiency when in crisis. So community collaborators, um, it's so important um, to really take more of a community-based response or community-centered crisis response. And that really involves working closely with community organizations and community stakeholders. And what that does is that it allows for proper alignment and allocation of resources, right? So we're all trying to work towards the same goal, which is to improve um, the lives and the care for individuals with limited English proficiency in our communities, and how can we work together to do that? And one of the ways is that we can leverage resources, we can make sure that individuals, both agency and community members are provided with the appropriate education and training. Um, and so really those collaborations and that um, uh, sort of working together collaboratively can have the most collective impact on addressing um, on addressing these needs. Ensure that um, individuals with limited English proficiency are involved in any or in any design development of a crisis response. So they can make recommendations, inform all phases of program or service delivery. So what should be our model for responding to crisis? What are the things that we as a community experience in a crisis situation um, that folks don't account for or folks don't seem to understand? So really ensuring that their voices um, are intrinsically involved and sort of centered um, in developing crisis responses. And then obviously the role of community itself is just their awareness of needs. Like they understand the needs, the barriers more so than we can understand sort of as an outsider. And so ensuring that um, their needs um, are prioritized, that they can communicate those needs, and then they can help lead coordinated efforts for prevention and intervention. So when we think about language access and alternative response models, there's a couple of different models in terms of crisis response. Um, and really not any one approach likely will be, uh, you know, the only approach, but really multiple approaches are often needed to build like a robust crisis response um, that meets local needs and language needs. So mobile crisis response teams, obviously, you know, we're in Ohio, so I think folks are familiar with mobile crisis, but um, they're usually composed of, you know, a variety of individuals, including potentially even peer supporters um, who respond to people in crisis and provide immediate stabilization and referral to community-based resources. Um, mental health, psychiatric nurse, uh, psychiatric um, urgent care services. So this can include like crisis and warm lines. So those are like crisis warm lines are telephone lines that are staffed by trained clinicians who provide remote counseling to people in crisis um, as an alternative to calling like law enforcement or, or 911. Um, so warm lines are often staffed by um, like trained peer supporters or people who have lived experience um, with mental illness um, or behavioral health concerns um, who are not um, uh, and can provide folks and support um, to people who, um, who call in. Um, peer navigator programs are also um, programs that have shown some um, potential and promise um, in this area. And these programs hire and train peers who have lived experience, um, and they may be one way to provide support um, and to avoid calls to the police or trips to the emergency department. Um, so just some other models. Now, with all of these models, we have to think about how do we incorporate language access within these models, right? So mobile crisis response teams, what is the, do we have an on-hand interpreter for the most common languages that that community Basis. Do we have access to uh, an iPad or a telephone that provides um, uh, language services? And again, back in Oklahoma where I worked, um, it was partnering with community-based organizations so that they were sort of um, available to do um, uh, sort of like crisis calls and go on these crisis calls with them. Um, and so it's sort of thinking about like, how do we integrate language access within all of these services, but there should be a plan in order to do so. Um, we also have co-responder models. So that's been shown to have some promise as well. So that's when behavioral health clinicians co-respond with officers potentially um, as first responders to situations involving someone in a behavioral health crisis. So that would be the sort of a primary co-response model. A secondary co-response model would be behavioral health clinicians co-respond with officers in patrol cars at the request of police officers who first respond to the situation. So um, sort of a secondary um, response. Um, and clinicians may also respond remotely via phone or telehealth support. So I, Robin was sort of highlighting a, a version of this, um, uh, of this co-responder model. And then we also have crisis intervention teams. Um, these are police officers generally, um, or when we think about 
CITs, it's sort of thinking about sort of the law enforcement or sort of police, um, more of a police response or law enforcement response. Um, but those are police officers typically with 40 hours of specialized training to respond to behavioral health calls, de-escalation, and direct people to appropriate services. Um, so these are essentially trying to focus on alternative response models that aren't immediately emergency department or just law enforcement, um, typical uh, traditional law enforcement, but specialized training in, in the crisis intervention side of things. But for all of these, these models cannot be developed or conceived without specific attention to how are we incorporating language access. Um, and again, maybe we start off with an iPad, but eventually, again, thinking about that language access plan, um, our goal is to have, you know, on the ground in-person interpreters, um, which may or may not be the best solution. As Robin mentioned, sometimes it might be um, some of the research shows that we're talking to someone on an iPad or um, telephonically or virtually, um, maybe more um, individuals may be more receptive to that. So again, it's going to be based on what the community needs and what the community informs you would be the best approach um, to addressing this. I just wanna sort of talk about like, we talked a lot about systemic and structural issues in terms of how you support services and resources for individuals with limited English proficiency. This is one of the sort of guides, um, guiding principles that, and frameworks that we wanna sort of rely on. Um, the national class standards are intended to advance health equity, improve quality and help eliminate health disparities. And this standards essentially serve as a blueprint, a framework, if you will, to help um, agencies and healthcare organizations um, really reduce disparities by providing more respectful and responsive care. Um, the principal standard is sort of to provide this overall, um, if you will, provide like an overall um, equitable, effective, um, and understandable um, provision of service that is, again, respectful and responsive to individual needs. The principal standard um, is sort of the guiding principle, but then the other standards are sort of grouped by theme. Um, and I just sort of want to emphasize communication and language assistance. Um, so there are four primary areas within this uh, theme, and the standards include offering language assistance to individuals who have limited English proficiency and or other communication needs at no cost to them to facilitate their access and um, to services, inform all individuals of the availability of language assistance services clearly and in their preferred language verbally and in writing, ensure the competence of individuals providing language assistance, right? So again, we don't want to rely on ad hoc interpreters such as like family members necessarily, particularly in crisis situations because there's just a lot of emotionality that goes along with that. Um, and so it would be hard to sort of, um, it would be hard to exert some control over that situation in a way that potentially some of an individual's biases or beliefs or things may come across um, if we're using ad hoc interpreters um, during those high stress situations. Um, and we so with that, we have to recognize that the use of untrained individuals and or minors and as, as interpreters should be avoided. Um, with that said, I understand that in crisis situations, there may, if there's nothing available, you may have to rely on a family member to potentially try um, and ensure that that individual stays safe. And I understand that. I understand just sort of the reality of the situation in certain circumstances. By all means, again, we try to avoid it, um, which is why we think about structural change and largely catalyzing um, systemic change to try and help provide more support. But in those instances, sort of thinking back to some of the um, recommendations for individual level work in terms of how do you navigate a situation like that. Um, and then the other standard is to provide easy to understand print and multimedia materials and signage in the languages most commonly served by the populations in the service area. Um, if you're interested, because when the National Class Centers were originally conceived, it really seemed to target more health and healthcare. That's sort of what it was built for, sort of traditional healthcare organizations. Um, but because of that, we it was also meant to apply to behavioral healthcare, mental healthcare. But there was some like discussion about like, it doesn't seem quite to fit, or how do you apply this to behavioral healthcare? There is actually now a guide um, to try and inform and facilitate implementation of class standards within behavioral healthcare systems. So this is available at this link and, and um, not behind a paywall, so you can access that easily. I wanna sort of end on just some, some calls to action, like what can we do now to sort of address some of these issues? So things we can do is we can move upstream. Again, we have to sort of just sort of uh, grapple with the fact that in order to change and really sort of provide consistent um, linguistically appropriate care, it is going to require some structural change um, and some larger uh, systemic change to accommodate language needs and reduce barriers in a consistent way when it comes to crisis response. Um, we have to stop overlooking linguistic needs, frankly. When we talk a lot about, and, and they do a lot of consulting work, when we talk a lot about um, 
health equity. There's a lot of emphasis on culture and culturally appropriate care. And yes, individuals with limited English proficiency, that has a culture in and of itself. But we need to intentionally ensure that we're not leaving out the linguistic part of linguistically appropriate care. Um, and that is essential in promoting equity. Um, and we have to keep the conversation going. Ongoing reflection and conversation about meeting the needs of individuals with limited English proficiency, those conversations have to continue. That dialogue has to continue, right? Sort of like out of sight, out of mind. If we're not actively thinking about it, we're not we're not doing anything about it. So we want to ensure that you know, we're including um, those individuals, that community, particularly when we're talking about promoting equity. Again, I know we talk a lot about promoting equity. And oftentimes, I think you know, the first sort of groups that pop into mind are um, uh, like cultural responsiveness and cultural humility, cultural competency, all of that. But again, just like making sure that we're also thinking about um, linguistic um, appropriateness as well. And what else can you do? You can ask questions. If you are an individual who works for an agency or community uh, or community organization, uh, institution, an entity, wherever you work, um, if you notice that there's a gap, you notice that this is something like, how would someone with a limited English proficiency navigate this process? Or, you know, how would they access crisis services? How do we provide services in crisis? Like, if you have any of those questions, ask those questions, you know, escalated up the chain. Um, because the more you can identify gaps and ask questions, it means it's now on the radar, right? And so I do encourage everyone to just sort of go back and think about like, what is your crisis protocol? And where does language sort of fit in that? And if there's no reference to language within your crisis protocol, there should be. Amplify individuals um, with limited English proficiency, their voices. Um, again, we want to ensure that, you know, I am fully fluent in English, right? I am not one of those individuals necessarily. I am bilingual. I speak a, a different language. I don't know what it's like to navigate an English dominant environment. I know what it's like to interpret for my family and I see what it's like for them, but I myself don't struggle or have that specific struggle. And so in making sure that we're amplifying the right voices, amplifying individuals who have difficulties navigating systems due to unaddressed language barriers. Um, again, it, the blame and the, the, I think the blame sometimes falls on individuals for not learning um, English, and that's not where it should go. We definitely should have access to more programs and services and make folks aware of uh, programs that can help um, increase uh, English fluency, but it's not, a deficit or it's not a fault of theirs that the system isn't responsive or isn't necessarily responding as quickly as we need it to um, to their unique needs. Ensuring community engagement and outreach, obviously we need to be in, you know, on the ground in the communities working with um, these communities and working with individuals with limited English proficiency because there's there's also a trust factor there, right? If I don't trust that the system can accommodate my needs, if I can't function in that system, I'm less likely to access that system. Um, I see that with my own family. Like, they don't necessarily like um, interacting with the healthcare system because it's complicated and it frustrates them and it gets things wrong and it causes harm sometimes. And I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand. Um, and so it is it's so maddening. This is just me on, a little bit on my soapbox now. It's just so maddening because I have to convince them to go to the doctor. I have to convince them to, you know, get their updated vaccination or what have you. And part of that is because their experience has been so frustrating, right? And it's hard to undo that. Um, and I work very hard to try and help promote um, that you know, we're going to ensure that they get the appropriate care, but it is, it's a struggle. Um, and my biggest, you know, my biggest concern is sort of always has been for my family is like the fear and the anxiety they sometimes have in emergent situations because they feel like something's going to go wrong because someone is not going to be able to understand them. And that's something that really no one should have to deal with. Um, and it's a very, it's a very like big point for me. It's, it, it causes some emotionality to come out in me. Um, but it is something that, you know, I want us to, to highlight is that no one really should have that, that fear um, just from a lack of understanding. Um, and we have to advocate for policy changes. Obviously, again, we're all individuals, um, but we all have within our sphere of influence things that we can do to catalyze change, whether that's within your own institution, within your own practice, just even being more reflective on your own practice, within your own institution, and then also potentially um, advocating you know, for change at a state level, at a federal level, um, for ensuring um, equitable access for individuals with limited English proficiency. These are references, and this is my contact information. So I um, will be on for a little bit more for the um, Crisis Academy. I may have to pop off for patient care. Um, so if I'm not available at any point when someone has a question, you are more than welcome to contact me at any of these um, 
contact information pieces um, that I've listed here. Um, and with that, I will turn it over for questions. Thank you, Dr. Sampilo. Um, and we will take uh, questions and answers uh, now. You can uh, direct those right to the Q&A box if you have any. Well, while we wait for those, I would just say that um, this was a really great presentation. Very powerful points. I really appreciated, you know, everything you said there. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that feedback. Um, you know, it's something I'm very passionate about. I will be honest and say I don't have all the answers, right? Like I wish I could take a magic wand to just like poof, everyone has resources and everything ha everyone has what they need. Um, but I think certainly I think the more we talk about it, the more we amplify the issue, um, I think goes a long way. Well, yeah, and I think you did a good job at like um explaining the issue. I think the it's almost an enigma that you know. If you don't speak the language, then everybody's like, oh, I have no idea what to do. And maybe there's an interpreter, maybe I can call them, but you know, um, it can be a jarring experience to have someone come and speak a language. You have no idea what they're saying. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, just an example, like even my onboarding, you know, at different jobs, like I it wasn't until I encountered an individual who didn't speak English and didn't speak a language that I can speak that I was like, what is the process here? Like, mm -hmm. what do we have available here? Because it wasn't as, it wasn't part of my onboarding. It wasn't mm -hmm. part of sort of the orientation, and it just sort of tells you, I think, again, as a gap, you know, because even that alone um, can be a really important intervention is ensuring that everyone, as they onboard into an organization, they know what the the resources are that are available. Right. right. We have about thirty more seconds. If there are any questions, of course, you can contact. Dr. Sampilo, after this presentation, if you have any any questions related to um, what she presented this morning. And I'm really bad at time and um, <laughs> dead airspace. So we'll we'll turn it back to uh, Fonda. Um, to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Sampilo. Thank you, Dr. Sampilo. Thank you once again, Elijah. Our final speaker is Latoya Logan. Latoya is the founder and CEO of Project Lift Services. Latoya is committed to improving services to underserved and often dismissed populations by creating spaces for innovative practices. Her presentation will focus on crisis response considerations for communities of color. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, before I begin, I feel like we almost need to take a deep breath and uh, recognize how much information we've covered in such a short amount of time. Um, let me make sure I turn up everything. And to thank the presenters before me as well, a lot of information, much needed information, on topics to kind of help us create for ourselves in, in our spaces that we are training um, health equity. Give me one moment, I'm just rearranging some things so that I can click the slide. So today I'm presenting on healing and health equity. And I have to forewarn you, I can pretty much talk about this topic for hours uh, because we this isn't the first time we've really tried to address health equity on a national level. Uh, in the 1960s, our federal government released a report detailing the impact of racism and racial disparities in services, whether it's social services, healthcare, behavioral health, and so on, and the impact of that on wellness. In 2015, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, our federal Oversight Board for Behavioral Health and Addiction Services released another report identifying in depth uh, this long range impact of unwellness and crisis and instability across communities of colors and underserved communities um, that are part of just systemic oppression and systemic overlooking. So for us to be here again in 2023, it's, it's interesting because maybe now we'll get to a place where we understand that it isn't necessarily an external process that is required to create health equity, but it really is in the hands of each provider, 
of each administrator, of each funder, and each legislator to collaborate on creating policies, processes, and practices that support the wellness of individual cultures, individual demographics, and really can address some of those disparities based on zip code. So our objectives today are pretty straightforward. We're going to define racism and, and racial trauma in the context of historical events and also what's happening today. We're going to evaluate the impact of racial disparities within behavioral health services and pay particular attention to clinician bias. And then finally, I hope to give you some actionable steps to take away today. So we're going to start today by just using critical race theory. And I know this has a lot of um, angst against it, and it's been framed in quite a negative way, but critical race theory has been around for decades and really is a theory that helps us to understand how race exists within our community, the impact of racism within our community, so that we can begin to dissect it and eliminate the disparities associated with it. So critical race theory defines racism as race prejudice, plus social and institutional power. This is really critical because it isn't just about a feeling that any individual has or a behavior that any individual organization is engaging in. It really is about a belief system that is then supported with social and institutional power, which means there are consequences and negative outcomes related to it. Racism is a system of advantage based on race, which means the opposite is true. It's a system of oppression based on race. So based on where you fall, um, you might have more power and privilege and you might have less power and privilege. And finally, racism is a white supremacy system, which is an ideology. It isn't really rooted in an actual race. It's rooted in a belief system about hierarchies of individual based on skin tone, based on nationality, based on geography, and so many other things um, pulled into that. It is important to note that racism is not simply black and white. And I know it kind of gets uh, watered down to it being black and white. And that's because we can see colorism as a factor of how people are engaged with um, denied services or provided with privilege. But it isn't about being black or white. It is about a belief system that you hold that helps you to, or I should say, um, has you believing certain things about another person. So it's deeply rooted in stigma. It's rooted in discrimination. And it's rooted in a desire to maintain um, the power and privilege you may have. So in 1999, the Surgeon General stated that they documented the existence of striking disparities for minorities and mental health services and the underlying knowledge base. And this, of course, impacts research. So what we know about serving communities across racial lines, across geography, nationality, is very limited because they are not often included in research. Racial and ethnic minorities have less access to mental health services than do whites, and they are less likely to receive needed care. When they receive care, it is more likely to be poor in quality. These disparities have powerful significance for minority groups and for society as a whole. And I highlight that racial and ethnic minorities bear a greater burden from unmet mental health needs and thus suffer a greater loss to the overall health and productivity. So when we think about mental health, it isn't just about how I am doing in terms of my wellness and my symptoms. It's much larger than that. It's how am I engaging in my classroom? Um, how, what nutrition am I receiving? It impacts our incarceration rates. It impacts homelessness. It impacts every aspect of life and living that a human being is going to have to endure. In October of 2021, the American Psychological Association released this statement. The APA failed in its role leading the discipline of psychology, was complicit in contributing to systemic inequities, and hurt many through racism, racial discrimination, and degradation of people of color. Now, that's a difficult statement for anyone to think, let alone for an organization to craft, to vote on, and to release into the public. And they go on to say that they are they accept the responsibility of how this has negatively impacted communities of color. The APA continued to say with their statement, 
Psychologists created, sustained, and promulgated ideas of human hierarchy through the construction, study, and interpretation of racial difference, and therefore contributed to the financial wealth gap and social class disparities. They go on to say the field of psychology has not historically supported research on communities of color by not adequately reporting and including them, minimally reporting them as a demographic data point, and or interpreting results based on Eurocentric research standards, thereby perpetuating invisibility and resulting in a lack of quality research. So when you hear that, it's important to not just hear those words and feel like, well, I don't think I've done it. It's to hear those words and understand how the field of psychology and behavioral health was crafted. It was crafted in a vacuum. It did not include people of color in any meaningful way other than to say, this would be a less intelligent brain. This is a brain in a body that doesn't feel pain the same way that those who are identifying as white do. This means that we're every symptom that we are assessing in 2023 in a person of color is really a symptom that we have recognized in maybe white culture that may not translate uh, directly or translate at all to communities of color. So this means it increases the risk of misdiagnosis, overdiagnosis of more psychotic uh, disorders, and even in issues in terms of how we prescribe medication, evaluate symptoms, and evaluate progress. Having said all of that, it's okay. Now we understand that this foundation by which we are practicing and that we've created um, this field on has significant disparities impacting wellness. How does that actually translate into the work that we do? Well, we know that as clinicians, the first thing we do is complete an assessment. And we ask questions based on what we believe will lead us to a great understanding or a greater understanding of this person. But if we are inherently biased, if we are inherently limited because of that deficit and understanding rooted in the development and maintaining uh, maintenance of our field, then that means we're not going to ask questions that would really be specific to or capture the experience of the clients in front of us. Health disparities as defined by health.gov is a particular type of health difference that is closely linked with social, economic, and or environmental disadvantage. And our speaker earlier spoke about Appalachian disparities of accessing resources, of understanding information. Uh, some of this is even rooted in our assumption that every single person who comes into our office has literacy or the comprehension skills to truly understand the language we are using. And that doesn't even go into what our last speaker talked about, just not understanding the language in general or speaking a different language. Health disparities adversely affect groups of people who have systematically experienced greater obstacles to health based on their racial or ethnic groups. So in, this, in the city of Cleveland, if we just look at location, we understand that pollution plays a heavy role in asthma occurrences, and respiratory infections in babies, um, and in overall life functioning. And we see that most high traffic areas are often through impoverished communities. If you look at Opportunity Corridor, it clearly goes through several communities of color that have traditionally been underserved, are under-resourced, and have not been invested in financially in decades. They go on to say that religion, Social economic status, gender, age, mental health, cognitive, sensory, or physical disability, sexual orientation or gender identity, geographic location, or other characteristics historically linked to discrimination or exclusion are a part of these disparities. Income plays a huge role in our ability to be well. Uh, in Ohio, there's a huge task force on addressing infant mortality because for some reason in uh, this state, Black women have mortality rates that rival third world countries and are more likely to die during birth or shortly after birth as a result of not really being seen by their physicians, not having their concerns taken seriously, and not being respected as experts on their own bodies. So income influences healthcare, 
what we who we can access, um, what we feel comfortable with doing, whether or not services are even covered. It can impact physician choice. If you have Medicaid, HMO, you may have options, but it's very difficult to select your own physician because you have a list that you may be seen by. It can impact referrals. Uh, you may need to see a pain doctor, uh, some a pain specialist, but if your PCP does not agree with you, then that referral may not happen because maybe your insurance doesn't cover that. It doesn't consider non-traditional remedies for treatment, which is a huge loss um, to our field uh, just across the board. We are now seeing how impactful yoga is to addressing PTSD and anxiety and depression. And while it's great that we're trying to include that in a clinical way, there are so many other non-traditional remedies and approaches that would be just as effective if we could choose not to see it through a Eurocentric lens. And finally, it can impact the respect that you're experiencing. I, my grandmother is 94 years old and she still believes that when you go in and you talk to a doctor, the doctor is, is the expert and she's not allowed to say, well, I don't like how this feels or I don't like how this is going. And this is again, this authority that creates an improper and unhealthy power dynamic in the relationship between the provider and the patient. And our perception that we must know everything. Racial trauma is defined as race-based traumatic stress, and it refers to the mental and emotional injury caused by encounters with racial bias and ethnic discrimination, racism, and hate crimes. And this can occur whether it is directly or indirectly. If you're watching the news and you feel as though stories are attacking your personhood, if you are trying to access resources, but doctors are saying, uh, you know, well, this is Ohio and I have a right to refuse services uh, because it violates my religious beliefs or my moral beliefs, then you are consistently being placed in a situation where you're defending your identity and where you might be concealing your identity so that you are not discriminated against or, or are receiving worse consequences. Any individual that has experienced an emotionally painful, sudden and uncontrollable racist encounter is at risk of suffering from a race-based traumatic stress injury. So what would be a uncontrollable racist encounter? And what's important here is that we don't get to define what that is. Uh, a person defines what that is for themselves. Um, and so our job as a provider is to listen and to allow ourselves to learn from our clients. I do a lot of work within the LGBTQ plus community and I work with trans identifying clients and it's some of the most important work that I do. And there are times when my clients will say, ooh, that was a little bit transphobic. It is my job not to, to rush to defend myself, but to be open to their expression and their feeling of what occurred in this interaction. If my goal is to support them, to see them, and to ensure that their needs are included in the services. Outcomes of racial trauma are seen in the body because of course we, we know that trauma lives in the body and that trauma can result in premature death. So irregular sleep patterns, sleep disturbance in general, not being able to fall asleep, not being able to stay asleep or sleeping, but not feeling restful because you're having nightmares or you're anxious about what will happen in the next day. It can result in the over or under consumption of food. And I think this is a key area that we are lacking a lot of information in. We are still very committed to a limited understanding of what an eating disorder looks like. And we haven't really assessed what an eating disorder looks like across cultural practices and traditions. So we're asking, are you eating? But we're not asking, what are you eating? Why are you eating? What is the emotionality connected to the food that you are consuming or the food you are restricting? There may be an increase in stress hormone release, which is rooted in our trauma core and connected to our crisis response system. So when we feel overwhelmed, our body can release cortisone. And that in and of itself has a significant impact 
on our nervous system, on our heart, on brain functioning, and it can directly influence how we engage with others and our ability to regulate ourselves. Anxiety is prevalent in racial trauma because of the anticipation or fear of being mistreated or experiencing discrimination. Hypervigilance, so being alert and constantly looking for the potential so that you can arm yourself and not become completely overwhelmed. And then of course, depression. Why is this happening to me? Why is this my experience? Toxic stress, which is something that is directly connected to how we cope. So cultures cope very differently um, uh, based on where you're from, where you grew up, what influences you have, what religious and spiritual beliefs you may have. So our coping is extremely important to understanding whether or not we're experiencing quantity stress, quality stress, or toxic stress. And toxic stress is a stress that isn't the byproduct of anything you are doing. It is the byproduct of societal influences and external factors that you don't have control over. And finally, genetic stress. So there's so much more research coming out every single day about epigenetics and how we hold all the genes of our families uh, genetically going back until however far it goes back. And based on the, their experiences, we then have those genes active or at least present in our bodies. So if you are coming from a family where you've experienced generational trauma, where you've experienced uh, mental unwellness and instability, then you already have those genes in your body. So all it takes is being triggered by an experience to activate those genes and then create that persistent stress within yourself. Zip codes play a major role in the quality of care and even if care is available at all. In 2018, uh, Washington wrote in the Cleveland newspaper, even if a person lives across the street from a major hospital, he or she may not seek help. If patients feel they aren't treated with dignity or doubt they are getting good care, they will not return or take medication. So a zip code matters. I live in the greater Cleveland area and East Cleveland is right in the middle of, of Cleveland. And it used to be a thriving community. And for years of divestment and poor management, Cleveland is a, East Cleveland is a difficult place to live in. Not only is the ratio of abandoned buildings to lived or, or occupied buildings way off, there's crime that is at a rate that doesn't make sense for the population that's there. Um, there is a lack of resources and there isn't even a grocery store in East Cleveland. So if you are a young person being raised in East Cleveland, one of the things we know is you automatically are gonna lose 12 years off of your life simply by living in that community. And it's important to note that East Cleveland is about 97% black. So not only, are they under-resourced and underfunded? And there are deficits and deficiencies in terms of their lack of nutrition, the lack of medical assistance that would be available. And even though they're only a bus ride away from several huge medical facilities in Cleveland, somehow they're losing 12 years off of their life simply because of where they're located. Behavioral health professional statistics. So we know that our field is not diverse. Uh, we understand the importance of representation. And while I am a huge supporter of increasing representation, I know that representation isn't enough. We will never have enough providers of color to meet the demands of every person of color who needs services. But what we can do is do a better job of educating professionals and helping them to challenge their own belief systems so that it does not influence the outcome for our clients. We know that our field is 71.2% white and about 80% of that is white women. We know that black or African-Americans only make up about 11.2%. Latino or Hispanic uh, individuals make up 10, a little over 10%. There's a mixture of unknown, which could be biracial individuals. Asian Americans only make up about 3.3%, and American, Indian, and Alaska Natives make up less than 1% of our field. 
So if we were treating indigenous individuals and we wanted to incorporate spirituality, not many of us would really have a good understanding of their spiritual base and their cultural traditions to include it in a meaningful way to influence healthy and positive outcomes. Ethnopsychiatry is the study of how culture and genetic differences in human groups determine and influence the response to psychotropic agents. Now, I have to tell you, I am a bit of a nerd. I love reading about everything and anything related to behavioral health because I really want to support my clients and help them to achieve their level of stability and wellness. And one of the things that I consistently am met with with my clients is a mistrust of medication. I don't want to take it. I heard terrible stories. I don't want to take it. It's going to make you a zombie. I don't want to take it. It makes me feel odd. And for years in my career, I said, okay, well, maybe you just aren't giving it a chance. Maybe you need to wait the 14 days or 21 days for it to actually get in your system. Maybe um, you do need an increase of medication. But when I learned about ethnopsychiatry, I understood that the bulk of our field has no idea what an ethnopsychiatry is and that we're not prescribing medication or even considering the efficacy of medication based on the principles of ethnopsychiatry. So ethnopsychopharmacology, I know it's a big word, is basically a way of looking at how ethnicity and culture influences an individual's response to medication. This isn't just about whether or not you like it or you don't believe in medication. This is really looking at a genetic or psychosocial occurrence that might be actually impacting the efficacy and implementation of that medication in their system. Higgins wrote in 2021, because minority groups are underrepresented in the drug development process, we need a clearer picture of how different medications may affect subsets of our population. So if we are gaining a, a more thorough and expanded understanding of how trauma lives in the body, and we are open to the field of epigenetics, that tells us that yes, genetically, there are going to be differences uh, based on culture and race. Then we also have to think about whether or not our interventions, whether they be therapy or medication are effective for the individuals that we are serving. So metabolism and over-medication is a huge issue within the field. And we see the impacts of that and the consequences of that um, on individuals every single day. 33% of Black Americans and 37% of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are what we would call slow metabolizers of several antipsychotic and antidepressive medications. So what does that mean? You've seen this in the emergency room. Someone comes in and they are asking for, or they're in crisis, they need medication. And the nurse says, okay, we're gonna give them a PRN. And in 15 minutes, they come back and this person is not functioning at the level that they want them to. So they give them another PRN and they wait 15 minutes and they come back and they're still not functioning at the level at which they want. So they give them another PRN. Finally, the person has completely calmed down. They are unaware and completely disconnected to what is happening. And then we go, aha, I guess that's the dosage they need. They don't need 20, they need 150. That is inaccurate. If you are a slow metabolizer of medication, what that means is it may not take you 15 minutes to metabolize that first shot. It may take 45 minutes. So we have to be more patient in allowing our clients to respond to the treatment we are giving as opposed to seeking an immediate change in their behavior and their response. When we over-medicate people, we are creating significant impairments in life. We are changing lives and we are doing damage because we are creating mistrust. That individual is probably not going to want to take medication moving forward. They are not going to trust you moving forward. The side effects of being over-medicated could be as much as a, a drooling, not being cognitively aware or present, uh, being unable to work. And it could be even more difficult and dangerous than that. It could cause serious uh, medical disability. It can create new symptoms because if I'm being treated for a disorder 
that I actually don't have, and I'm being medicated at a level that is far greater than I need, then of course I'm going to develop new symptoms. And unfortunately, what that does is it restarts the cycle because once that client develops a new symptom, they go back to the doctor and the doctor or the therapist says, oh, wow, you have new symptoms. You need a second medication to address this issue when the issue is over medication. It can lead to inappropriate treatment. We know that we are diagnosing schizophrenia far too much. We are diagnosing quite a few illnesses uh, at a rate that doesn't really make sense with what we would see in the population. And of course, as I mentioned, long-term disability. Clinician bias occurs from the moment we see a client. How do they walk into our office? What do we think about them? How are we assessing for symptoms? What do we really believe is possible for a person based sheerly on our understanding of that community, of what symptoms look like, and what we believe progress looks like? We often stereotype Asians as problem-free because we do have an inherent issue of calling Asian Americans good minorities. And so we treat them as such. They must not need very much. White therapists commonly rate Black clients more negatively than white clients with the same behavior. And this is ever present in our school systems and our legal systems and criminal justice systems and how we choose to advance in our higher ed education systems. And of course, it impacts everything that we see on the media. So if we're treating people differently who present the same way, then we're causing damage to whomever we have a stigmatized perspective of. Clinicians often reflect the discriminatory practices of their society, separate but equal. And I know this is hard, but I too fall victim to this belief system. If you are a person who believes you know something, you understand a person before they start talking, they've given you three lines and you got the whole story, then what you're doing is you're pulling on information that was never provided to you in that session. And you're relying on whatever information or thoughts or beliefs you have about this group, as opposed to really listening to what the client is saying. Clinicians often believe they are the experts and fail to ask questions that may make them look unknowledgeable. So a client comes in and they say, I have anger issues and they're a little aggressive. Instead of really pulling that apart, if they happen to be a black male, it's like, yeah, you do have anger issues. What we know is that black males are often rated as aggressive sheerly by their posture, their attire, and how they walk. So we are misinterpreting symptoms and symptom expression because of stigma that we carry rooted in racial bias. When clients don't come back, instead of saying, wow, what did I do to not connect? Or what did I do that didn't allow this client to feel safe? We tend to blame them. Oh, they're not following up because they don't really care about their healthcare. They're not really invested in getting better. Um, they just wanted to come here because they were drug seeking. And truly, a lack of follow-up may be due to how you've engaged with that client. Are you rushed because you know you only have 15 minutes to speak to the client? So you're, come on, give me the information quickly. Are you dismissive? Because you believe the issue is over here is more important than the issue the client may perceive as a priority. Are you silencing just with your demeanor and I am the doctor? I have a client who is now 43 years old, black male. He came in because he said, I have anger. I am mad all the time and my heart starts beating. After a month or so, we realized what he really was having was panic attacks because he has severe anxiety. So his entire life, he has been told he has anger issues, that he needs to manage his anger and he has received consequences as a result of the perception that he is angry. When in reality, he's just suffering from anxiety and having panic attacks. Imagine what could have been his life if at 16 years old, when he started to say, I am having issues and my heart is pounding, that instead of calling it anger, we chose to dig a little deeper. Clinician bias is rooted in Western philosophy and medicine, and none of us as providers can ignore that. That is a fact. We are learning it. It is, it is our education into this field. So we have to accept 
that we are promoting disparities because we are promoting research and information that is rooted in disparities. Conflicting worldviews of the link between spiritual and mental health directly impacts the overall wellness and engagement of a client. How often are we really taking into consideration the spiritual holistic qualities and traditions of our clients to inform what we're choosing to do? Or are we quickly jumping to, well, this is the way that we treat this, or this is the way that we respond to it? The DSM-5-TR is limited and biased. In fact, when this DSM-TR was released, there were literally about 30 books written on the cultural limitations of the criteria, of the symptom inclusion, and of course, how we even would utilize differential diagnosis. Because our disorders were developed in a vacuum meaning, we still today use criteria that was created and developed with research on all white males, research that was conducted by all white males who did not consider other experiences. So we have to acknowledge that there is limitation and bias and even what symptoms would be consistent with a particular disorder. Now that doesn't mean that we throw the DSM-5-TR away, but what it does mean is that we should always be seeking to clarify and to question whether or not this disorder is harming our clients or serving the wellness of our clients. Culture is not integrated in a meaningful way because we tend to believe that culture is separate from our actual physical or mental wellness. That if we could give you medication, if we could really engage you in CBT, you would be fine. But culture determines what we believe is possible for our lives. It determines hope. It, de it determines whether or not we think we can get better, and it determines whether or not our symptoms are an asset or a limitation. So there are some cultures that believe auditory hallucinations, which may be communing with spirits, we don't know, are an asset that it allows them to see things from a different perspective. So if we are committed to, well, no, that's just mental health we're gonna lose that client and we won't be able to help them in any meaningful way. The client experience is impacted by our bias first because research tells us that clinicians over pathologize ethnic individuals by misinterpreting normative behavior as indicative of mental disorders. So what that means is because our idea of what is normal, and we tend to do that, we need to get you back to normal functioning, we need to get you back to a healthy baseline, but that standard of what is normal and what is healthy is rooted in stigma and our explicit and implicit bias about functioning, about what is acceptable, and about behavior. So we have to challenge whether or not we are considering normative behavior as our behavior. Immigrants, Black Americans, and Latino Americans are diagnosed with higher rates of psychotic disorders. So that means I'm getting diagnosed with a psychotic disorder that I don't have, which means I'm going to have to take medication or I certainly will be prescribed medication for a psychotic disorder that I don't have, which means I'm probably going to develop some side effects and consequences as a result of taking medication for a disorder that I do not have. But worse, that means I'm not being treated for the actual thing that I do have. So that's only going to worsen, which will probably cause an increase of medication that I do not need. Inaccurate diagnosis and treatment is not far behind. So if we're over-diagnosing psychotic disorders, that means we're under-diagnosing anxiety-based disorders, depressive-based disorders. So a person may actually benefit more from non-medication therapy but because we've diagnosed them with an, a, a criteria or an illness that medication is most often prescribed for, then we're not providing effective treatment. This reinforces mistrust and resistance to re-engage. I always tell my staff, you know, we can be fired. We're not always the best clinician or provider for a client, and we have to be okay with that. Um, just as you would shop for a car. Not every car is going to suit your needs. So it's the exact same way when it comes with as to a provider. If you are realizing that you're not building a healthy rapport with the client or the client isn't opening up to you, it isn't okay to just jump to the conclusion that this client doesn't want help. 
some of it may be they just don't want to work with you. Maybe you're not the best fit for what they're going through. And that's okay. It's okay not to be the best provider for every client. Um, this is why we have specializations. So see that as a benefit to your service as opposed to a limitation. Because if you work with a client and you are having an unhealthy exchange and it's adversarial and it's hostile and the client doesn't feel seen, the chances of them seeking out another provider once your relationship has been terminated is very, terminated is very low. So that means we have a person who needs help who now does not trust that if we are not a good fit that we won't refer them elsewhere. And then we engage in penalty over service far too often. Police are not appropriate to respond, responding to mental health or medical crisis. Um, jail and detention centers, even if it's a diversion center, is not the most appropriate place for individuals who are experiencing mental health crisis because there is an innate feeling and presence of disempowerment within those environments that does not aid itself or lend itself to opening up. Anyone who is court ordered to treatment is going to struggle a bit in treatment because they know everything they share will be shared with individuals they would prefer it not be shared with. So we really do need to think about if we're going to, you know, court order people to treatment, we're going to require treatment um, in order to advance that we provide some safeguards so that clients feel safe and free and open to engage in the services, knowing that the information will not be used against them at a later date. Client consequences also include long-term disability, and this could be medical or mental or both. It could result in a chronic instability because they're unable to obtain or maintain employment, housing, or social networks. Um, it's really sad. I've worked in, in homelessness for a number of years, and it's, it's sad, it's overwhelming to see how many individuals are homeless who also have a mental health or a physical disability. It, it is just, it makes no sense to me. There is an increased mental health crisis uh, instances where, you know, every month they're engaging or they're unfortunately having a crisis because they're not engaged in ongoing treatment or care because they don't trust it. So the only time they're being supported or served is when they are arrested or they're receiving a consequence. And finally, we all know that even if you find a great medication, if you go on and off, if you're inconsistent with taking it, then that medication loses its efficacy and you increase your tolerance to it, which means you need higher doses, you need to take, you might have to take more than one, and that can also lead to significant impairment and disability. As clinicians and providers, we need to consider the language we are using. Are we affirming our clients? You know, there's great research that says if we really want to impact positive outcomes in clients, we need to consider three things. The first thing is the extra factors in their lives. So are they in a safe home? Are they in a loving environment? Are they free of abuse and neglect? Secondly, we need to think about positive expectancy of the therapist. If you believe this person can get better and you are willing to go on that journey with them. And number three, the therapeutic relationship. How are you building rapport and creating a safe environment for this client to express themselves? Those are the top three factors to helping a client achieve wellness. And they have nothing to do with your education or your licensure, or the intervention you are selecting. This is all human work that has to take place before we get to an actual clinical intervention. So when we're calling clients non-compliant, which is a huge pet peeve of mine, it's what are we expecting from them? If we have a client who has come into service, who's court ordered, I think we should anticipate some non-compliance. If we have a client who is coming in after several crises, we should anticipate non-compliance. If we have any clients who are coming in with a level of instability in their life, we should anticipate non-compliance and we shouldn't be holding that against them as a way of discharging them prematurely or transferring them to someplace else. 
Sometimes noncompliance is simply a byproduct of what's happening in my life. If your clients are late to group or they're, they're late to an appointment or they're missing an appointment, have you asked the question about transportation? How are you getting to the office to see me? Maybe this time that we're scheduling really doesn't work because of the bus system. Maybe it's too close to you picking up your children, so you're going to get here late. We have to think outside the box when we're really trying to affect positive change and improve the wellness of our clients. Sometimes we say our clients are unmotivated to change. And again, why? Why, why would this ever be an assumption that we are making? Clients are motivated to change. That's why they came to you. Now, can they be consistent in their change? Maybe, maybe not. We should anticipate that they're going to be great for a couple of weeks. They might fall off. They may come back. Sometimes they're going to come in and they're going to be totally silent because that's the nature of what we're doing. We're working with people who are overwhelmed, who are frustrated, who often feel unseen and silent. So the anticipation that they should walk into our office so excited to see us is hubris on our part. And our job is to be thankful that they made it there. If my client comes in and they're 45 minutes late, I tell them, I'm just excited that you made it. I'm happy to see you well. I'm happy to see that you even tried to get here. I can only give you 15 minutes, but I'm thankful you still made the effort of coming. That then will translate into efficacy and engagement down the line. But when we are so upset, oh, you came here late and we look at it as disrespect, that has nothing to do with treatment. That has more to do with us. How we evaluate aggression. This is a big one for me. Um, I work with a lot of court-involved clients. I've worked in juvenile justice and adult justice, and I love working within the criminal justice system because every client is diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder or conduct disorder if they're juvenile. And across everything, it says aggressive, aggressive, aggressive. And when I meet with them, what I often see by aggressive is they use profanity. Um, maybe they slam the door a little hard. Uh, they're moving in and out of their seat. Maybe they're yelling. And it is alarming to me because when I think about someone suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, it is completely consistent that they would be aggressive, a little paranoid, a little hyperactive. We should anticipate those symptoms in our office. In fact, we should welcome those symptom expressions in our office because that's what's going to help us better understand our clients, their level of distress, their frustration tolerance, and the social impairment they're having. And none of that has to be aggression. Some of that is fear. Some of that is disappointment and hurt. Some of that is shame that I even have to be in this office talking to a total stranger about what I am experiencing. Zero tolerance policies is another pet peeve area of mine. They're not making group like they're supposed to. They didn't do their homework. I would encourage you to ask yourself, what is the benefit of a zero tolerance policy? If you're discharging a person because they're presenting with instability, how do we anticipate or expect them to ever reach stability? Zero tolerance policies are not consistent with the harm reduction model. They are not consistent with the recovery model. They are not consistent with good clinical care. We should never discharge a client simply because they have done something short of injuring someone from the program. So yelling and screaming, you know, again, I encourage my staff and I follow this for myself, check our sensibilities at the door. We shouldn't be so sensitive that if we hear profanity, oh, I'm so disrespected. That if we hear yelling, oh, I'm so afraid. I worked with uh, veterans for a number of years and I had a client who I just thought, I mean, what progress he was making. He was an OEF, OIF veteran who had been in two explosions in Afghanistan and had suffered a traumatic brain injury as well as post-traumatic stress, as well as developing an alcohol addiction. For years, he struggled. He's only 35 years old, but he really struggled to find 
a level of grounding and stability. And after working with him for six months, he finally agreed to go into the trauma treatment program. His first day walking into the program, he meets with a nurse in a room and she asks him a question. Tell me about what happened in Afghanistan. So he jumps up and he starts punching his hand and he's telling a story and he's using profanity and she hits the button. And at this time, a signal donut is when we knew that there was violence and we need to all come run and catch. So the police get there, everybody's there, and he's looking bewildered. Well, what's happening? And she says, he's threatening, he's violent, he's dangerous, he's punching his hand. And he is looking bewildered like, what? I'm telling you what you asked for. You asked for this information. This nurse did not understand that in order for him to share such a traumatic experience, that he needed to get grounded by empowering himself, which was to create an air of dominance for him. This had nothing to do with her, but we tend to internalize behaviors we don't care for as an affront against us. And this particular nurse asked for a behavior flag to be placed on this veteran. Well, you can believe that veteran never returned to the trauma treatment program and refused to receive treatment at the VA whatsoever, say working with me because I worked in housing. What a loss, what a loss. That same day after being sober for six months, he relapsed because well, where's the hope? So we have to be careful that we are not interpreting behavior that is normal functioning and consistent with the mental health issues and social impairments that the client is presenting with to get treatment for. So how do we take all this information and create something that changes? So as I mentioned when I started, we've been talking about health equity and improving our communities for decades now. And we've not really gotten to a place where we, we know about it and we've made tangible implementation practices, policies, and funding initiatives to address it so we can achieve those outcomes. And some of that has to do with, one, not really listening to our clients when they tell us specifically what they need. So health equity, as defined by the Center for Disease Control, is the state in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health very aspirational, very ambiguous. But they go on to say that achieving this requires focused and ongoing societal efforts to address historical and contemporary injustices, overcome economic, social, and other obstacles to health and healthcare, and eliminate preventable health disparities. So what are these health disparities? One of them is transportation. As I read to you earlier in the training, that even if, you, if you're in the city of Cleveland and you live in an impoverished community of color, even if you are right across the street from a hospital, you are least likely to go there for treatment. So one of the things we have to do is targeted and prioritized engagement. We have to make sure that we are reaching individuals where they feel safe and providing services where they feel safe. It's great to have a beautiful office. You know, some of us are like, ah, oh, we worked and we finally made it into that office that is really cute and decorated the way that we like. But what good is that office if we're not really providing services in our community? We have to think about the economics of healthcare. How costly are medications? How costly is it for a client to come to your office? And you might be thinking the only cost is the gas or the bus fare to get there. But did they have to take off work because we don't have enough after hour or weekend appointments? Did they have to borrow money in order to lift to our office? Do they have to put their children in daycare or in the care of someone else they have to pay for in order to come to our appointments? We can do a better job of addressing this by simply enhancing and expanding the telehealth services and in-community services that we provide. We can also look at increasing our prevention field. State of Ohio offers an amazing certification to become a prevention specialist, assistant, or specialist or consultant. And what this means is we have trained individuals who are tasked with the job of providing education, outreach, and linkage to services 
in the communities where these individuals live. I understand it's important to come into the office sometimes, but I also understand the value of creating credibility within our communities. And if your entity historically has stigma or a perception that it does not engage well with the community, then it's gonna be very difficult to get individuals to come there. As stated earlier by one of our speakers, nothing for us without us. Nothing for us without us. If you're creating campaigns, if you're creating programs, if you're creating initiatives and in marketing to reach communities of color, but you don't have people of color working on those initiatives, then you're not doing a great job. Uh, we are in May and you know, in the Cuyahoga County, Juneteenth is now a holiday that city officials get off and many organizations are preparing for their Juneteenth celebrations. My advice is, if prior to 2020, you did not celebrate Juneteenth, you shouldn't be celebrating it now. Instead, you should be taking those funds and working with community organizations who have longstanding uplifted those experiences. And this will be across the board, whether it's a LGBTQ plus community, uh, an Asian community in Cleveland, huge, beautiful Asian community, we shouldn't be doing anything that isn't orchestrated and implemented with their leadership. If we're truly trying to be inclusive and we're truly trying to change racial disparities, we have to have difficult conversations. And by difficult conversations, we tend to not have them. We think we are. You know, we say things like, I'm going to talk about race. I know it's difficult. That's not a difficult conversation. That's not a difficult statement. It is 2023. If we can't get down to the bare bones of how our systems, how our policies, how our practices are promoting racism and discrimination, then we're not having difficult conversations. So we have to break the silence and avoid safe dialogue. Safe dialogue doesn't mean that we are going to curse anyone out, that we have to be disrespectful or dismissive. Safe dialogue means that we are going to be understanding that we will have to sit in discomfort, that having a meaningful conversation around racial disparities means we have to sit in discomfort. We have to call out performative gestures for health equity, meaning just because you put some beautiful paintings in the office space that reflects multiple cultures, that does not mean that you are culturally inclusive. Because my guess is not a single client cares about the photos you have on the wall. They care about the respect level that they receive when they walk in the door and they don't look the way you anticipate or would want them to look. We need to address power within conversations. As I mentioned, Whenever I do an assessment with a client, I acknowledge first and foremost that there is a power dynamic here, that as a clinician with the power of the pen to, to write a diagnosis, to make treatment recommendations, to potentially make recommendations to the court system, I have an, an un, uh, unchecked amount of power in this relationship. So it is my job to balance that power and be reciprocal by lifting my client's voices, by allowing them to challenge me, by encouraging them to tell me what isn't working. And if they want to fire me, they have the right to do that too. And I will help find them another therapist. Number three, we have to honor pain and heal them. We can't be so defensive. Well, I'm not doing that. I know that as a clinician who has an education that's rooted in Western philosophy and Eurocentric ideas, that I have perpetuated that, that, that discrimination and that stigma, even if I did it inadvertently, it can happen. We have to accept that sometimes we have been offensive, we have been dismissive, we have been unhelpful, even when we've intended to do so. So we wanna check our defensiveness because that's just toxicity. Anytime we feel the need to rush to our own defenses instead of really trying to understand where the other person is coming from, then we're making them invisible. When my clients have called me transphobic, I said, oh goodness, tell me how, where, what should I do differently? I apologize. Wow, I didn't mean that, but tell me, educate me. I'm open to that because that's the only way I'm gonna learn and that's the only way I'm going to hopefully impact positive changes 
and my clients. There we go. We have to consider idioms of stress. Now, this was in the DSM-5. 3 TR, the DSM-3 TR, um, and it was removed from the update, our cultural assessment, which I'm going to go over in a second, but it really covered in detail idioms of stress. Idioms of stress are ways in which different cultures express experience and cope with feelings of distress, so it doesn't look the same across cultures. The best thing we could do is really ask individuals to name a couple of emotions and help us to tie it to language that we understand for ourselves. One example of somatization or the expression of distress may be through physical uh, symptoms. So they give the example of stomach, stomach disturbances, excessive gas, palpitations, and chest pains as being common forms of somatization in Puerto Ricans, Mexican Americans, and whites. So you might be hearing, oh, my, my stomach hurts, but what they're really saying is I might be depressed. I might be frustrated and overwhelmed. So we want to make sure that we are understanding the language so that we can appropriately refer and connect. Some Asian groups express more cardiopulmonary and vestibular symptoms such as dizziness, vertigo, and blurred vision. These all present as physical health issues, but may very well be behavioral health issues. And finally, in Africa and South Asia, somatization sometimes takes the form of burning hands and feet or the experience of worms in the head or ants crawling under the skin. This is so important because this could be misinterpreted as psychosis as opposed to a cultural understanding and interpretation of feelings of nervousness and jitteriness in the body. Culture balance syndromes also was included in the DSM-3, not so much in the DSM-5. It kind of glosses over it. But it talks about clusters of symptoms that are more common in other cultures, in some cultures than others, and usually in less dominant cultures. So they give the example that some Latino patients, especially women from the Caribbean, display, I cannot say this correctly, and I'm not going to butcher it, um, a condition that includes screaming uncontrollably, attacks of crying, trembling, and verbal or physical aggression, fainting or seizure-like episodes, and suicidal gestures may sometimes accompany these symptoms. It doesn't mean that we're going to bypass it and say, ah, it's not that, but it gives us information to say, hmm, let's look into this a little bit deeper to understand that this is anxiety, this is depression, we, we need to, to spend more time evaluating. Now, in the DSM-3, we were given this outline for formulation, uh, and actually it was in the DSM-4, which was great. And I used to use this document all the time because it gave you uh, questions that you can ask to be more culturally inclusive. So the first thing it, it suggests is that we have to inquire about a patient's cultural identity to determine their ethnic or cultural reference group, language abilities, language use, and language preference. Number two, we have to explore possible cultural explanations of the illness. That is important <laughs> because if we're dealing with individuals who have a more holistic spiritual perspective, then some of these things are going to be considered as advantages as opposed to illness. So we want to look at idioms of stress, the meaning of those of the meaning and perceived severity of their symptoms. We also want to consider preferences related to past experiences or what they believe is most important today. Number three, we want to consider cultural factors related to psychosocial environment and levels of functioning. So what is the normalization in my community about seeking treatment? If I admit that I'm sick, does that make me sicker? And there are some communities that truly believe that. If you go to the doctor, that's when you're going to get sick. So we, we have to make sure that we're addressing and incorporating that belief system. Number four, critically examine cultural elements in the patient-clinician relationship to determine differences. So we should be asking them what their symptoms are against the symptoms that we would traditionally look for to see if there's crossover or if it's just a misuse of language and we're really saying the same thing. We wanted to use that to also build rapport and to encourage disclosure. I often tell my clients, in fact, I think it's an asset. Uh, I have been in therapy because what that does is it normalizes that people need help. And a person like me who's here to help can also need help as well. And it, it tends to reduce or at least balance a bit that power dynamic of the relationship. And finally, we wanna render an overall cultural assessment for diagnosis and care. So this means we take into consideration everything. 
We are looking at their spirituality. We're looking at their historical traditions, the historical trauma of their community, how they were raised in their immediate home versus the larger community to determine what would be best course of action. So for a review, you're going to receive these slides, but you're also going to receive a document that is called resources for you to continue your journey. And it covers um, several different uh, marginalized and underserviced communities and readings for each of them. So books, websites you can go to, because it is my belief that if we're going to actually achieve health equity, we have to see it as a journey that we're in investing in now and that every quarter we're looking at have we made progress? What is working? What isn't working? And what could we do different? And I will leave you with my favorite quote by Aboriginal uh, activist Lily Watson. If you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is tied up with mine, then let us work together. And in my opinion, this should be the perspective we take with every single client that walks through our door, that we are working with them and not for them. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, uh, Latoya, yeah. for um, that thought-provoking presentation. Um, really great information. We appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions, you can direct those to the Q&A box, and we'll uh, address, address those. I think um, people might be processing a lot. Yes, it's a lot of information in three hours. <laughs> Just someone said, great presentation. Thank you. Another great presentation. Awesome. Well, this is great for me. I appreciate the compliments. Let me have a good hump day. Thank you. <laughs> And the, the slides will be sent out along with the resource so people can, you know, take that step and look through it and, you know, kind of remember um, and process what, you know, everything we've been learning this morning on equity considerations for uh, during a crisis response. We have a little bit of time, so we just want to make sure that um, we give everyone an opportunity to ask any questions they have for Latoya, um, other than the continued accolades for the great presentation. Well, I don't see any more questions other than another great job. Uh, uh, Fonda, we can turn it back over to you. Once again, thank you, Latoya. Thank you, Elijah. I just can't thank all of our speakers enough. Such great presentations today. And I also want to thank you all for attending today's Crisis Academy. I also like to thank our sponsor, the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. As you might have seen, um, the link to the survey that I referenced earlier is now in the chat. You will also receive an email later on today with the same link. We encourage you all to um, complete the evaluation so we can process the CEUs. Um, please keep um, completed to also help us to inform future trainings, as well as to receive your continuous education credits. I want to thank you guys all once again and have a great rest of your day.